I'm pleased to introduce our, we have four speakers in this, uh, in this session. There's no concurrence, so we can go, we, we're going to go late, so everybody gets the same amount of time. time. And uh, I'm pleased to introduce an old friend of mine. He's not that old, uh, but we've known each other a long, long time. Uh, Steen Rasmussen, uh, who is at the uh, University of Southern Denmark in Odense, Odense? Yeah, Odense. Odense. and also uh, at the Santa Fe Institute. And he will speak on minimal life, intelligence, and our new technologies. Let's give a round of applause for Steen Rasmussen. It's an honor to be here. And it is true, we've known each other um, for a longer time than many of you, I mean, are old. So it goes way back. So I, I have a plan. Uh, Stuart, he asked me to talk a little bit about uh, minimal life, because we've been um, working with creating life in the lab for many years and how it relates to, uh, to intelligence and, and consciousness. And I, since uh, many of these new technologies that, uh, these living and lifelike technologies, the intelligent technologies, they have a huge impact already today and they will have much higher impact on our lives. I will sort of end up the conversation or the presentation here by uh, addressing that a little bit. But what is it, uh, so what is life? And, and, and what is intelligence? I, I think that a good way to um, depict that is, is looking at this diagram. If you start down in, 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 the, in the lower left corner, um, that's where, where you can find a rock. And then if you go up from um, straight up, then you have uh, at the end uh, of, 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 the, of this ladder here, you actually have the simplest life forms that we can imagine. This is what I've devoted most of my, uh, at least, recent um, scientific life trying to do. And many of my colleagues, they have done something else. They've gone out, they've been running out the x-axis and tried to see um, whether they can make uh, artificial systems via uh, AI and machine learning smarter and smarter. And actually, they've been really good at it uh, because they can now, you have special purpose systems that are much better at many uh, specific tasks than humans are. And then, of course, this conference is about this very complicated stuff that happens up in the, in the upper right corner. So this is just to, to uh, give an overview of, of, of what we're doing. And, and what I'll do here, I'll mainly uh, I'll take, try to take you on a really quick tour up the y-axis uh, out in the left side here. So what is minimal life? And, um, you know, this is a philosophical question to some extent, but those of us who are actually um, working to create life in the lab, um, we have an operational definition where we say that to have life, you need to have a system that's able to take up resources, use free energy to convert these resources into building blocks so that the system can grow and divide. And you need to have inheritable information that enables, or at least in part controls, this growth and division. And if this information can change a little bit from one generation to the next, then you have the, well, then you have, uh, the possibility for, for selection. And once you have selection, you have evolution, and then you're done. So how hard can it be? It, it turns out it's not so easy. Um, so, so we've sort of, and we are not the only one who, who believes that uh, this is a pretty good operational uh, definition. We also, there's somehow uh, agreement on that uh, we need to have uh, three components to play together. We need to have a container that somehow uh, takes, that keeps the things together. We need to have an informational system and a, um, and a metabolic system. And, and then it's very important for these very simple systems that you have a, a nice environment. So I want to include that too. So our particular um, protocell design is based on, on this diagram here. And, and, and it, it, what it shows is that you have, the, uh, you have the metabolism out on the right side, and there is a, a material flow going from, uh, from the right to the left. And, um, and the driver of the whole machinery is, in our situation, life. And this goes into this metabolism that then generates the building blocks for the container as well as for the informational system. And the informational system catalyzes um, this production of new informational building blocks and container building blocks. And then the container, via self-assembly, keeps these things together. So a way to think about it is that we actually have a um, so the mental picture, I'll show a little movie in a, in a little while, where we have a, um, 
uh, we have a piece of used chewing gum. That's the container. And then on the exterior of this container, you stick your informational molecules and you stick your uh, metabolic molecules. That's pretty much the design of the protocell. So it's very different and much simpler than modern life. For those of you who are sort of scientifically interested, I'll just very briefly go through um, some of these components. A container can either be an oil droplet, which we'll see more about later. It can be a vesicle, or it can be a, a, a droplet, a water droplet in, a, in an oily or organic uh, suspension. Uh, the ones, uh, these small uh, reverse micelles, you can't see them. They are too small uh, to, to even uh, depict with a microscope. And let me just give you an example of how easy it is to actually uh, have such a cell division. Uh, you, if you have a particular kind of oil that you saturate with, um, with one kind of surfactant and you then put it into another, uh, in a, into a dish, a petri dish, which has another set of uh, um, surfactants, this, this is about a millimeter in, in diameter you'll see that you spontaneously can uh, have a droplets divide. So it's not so hard to actually make replication. Um, so this was this story here. Let's get back to the main story. Just a second, yeah. So, um, and I could go into details about the, uh, the hydrodynamics of what's going on. But this is a surface tension-driven instability. We also need to have the metabolic molecules, and the metabolic molecules we're using are ruthenium complexes, and they are very different from anything we use in modern life. We don't have ruthenium. Actually, it's poisonous for us to eat ruthenium. So, um, uh, but for this protocell here, uh, it turns out to be a good choice. So we stick them at the, at the exterior of, of the aggregate here. The informational molecules, they are also uh, attached to the exterior. And um, there was all kinds of issues for us to make that to work. And I just want to mention, it's difficult to show movies um, about that, so I don't want to do it. Um, but I want to say a few words to the, uh, to the scientists in here uh, that we have demonstrated <clears throat> in the lab how the metabolism, as it is attached to um, the container and controlled by a particular kind or a particular part of the informational molecule, namely the guanine, which is part of this informational molecule in the particular form that's called oxyguanine, we will be able to um, generate more. We will be able to turn one kind of uh, uh, container material into another kind, and then the container can actually divide, and we turn oil into, uh, into soap. I'll show that in a second. And also we've demonstrated how we can, uh, how we can turn these, uh, uh, these precursor, these uh, resource molecules into, uh, in, uh, into, I don't know what happened here. Okay, my... Uh, MATLAB trapped out here. Anyway, so, so, so we've, we've demonstrated that you can combine, or we, we can combine the informational uh, controlled metabolism uh, with, uh, with the container and, and also generate more container molecule and more uh, of these informational molecules. So for us to make a proto uh, cell life cycle, um, we need to, and I'll, instead of going through all these details, I think I'll show a, a movie which actually is a movie that um, Ryan and, and, and Dave Damer, that we will see in a little while, um, and I made um, many years ago to demonstrate what it is we are doing. This is oil, and when you put uh, soap in oil, you will, have the soap, you will have the soap sit on the exterior of the oil droplet. And if you then add, um, uh, yeah, so now we first added um, informational molecules that have a hydrophilic anchor and um, hydrophobic anchor, and here we, have, we add some uh, metabolic molecules, and now we have a protocell. Now, and of course there are gazillions of, there are many of them on the exterior of such a system here. Now we feed the system with, uh, with oil. 
And you know that uh, oil uh, doesn't like to be alone in the water, so these droplets, they will uh, coagulate and you'll have uh, a big fat guy now. So now he's ready to start his metabolism or her metabolism, maybe. Um, but before you can do that, you need to, uh, you need to make a copy of the information. And uh, you see up at the top here that we have, uh, 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 this is actually a DNA strand that we have uh, conjugated with, um, uh, with, with some uh, hydrophobic anchors. And now we can heat it up a little bit or we can adjust the temperature and other things um, so that when we provide um, oligomers that are, uh, these are, these are the resources, but they don't quite work yet, they will then match up in this way. For these guys to work, you need to digest them. At least one of them need to be digested, which you saw happen right there, by light coming in. And once you've done that, then you actually have a fully functional uh, copy of, of the other informational molecule. And what we use exactly the same chemistry to turn the oil into soap. And as we do that, then um, the, you can think about it as the volume is turned into surface and slowly but surely um, this guy will uh, simply become unstable and he will then or she will, will or it will uh, divide. And um, I think that will be shown here. And it's a little bit difficult but eventually it'll happen and this is why we're shining light on and we create more and more surfactant, more and more soap uh, from the oil. <laughs> Oop, here you go. So, so this is a sort of say um, um, an artist uh, rendering of <clears throat> of what's uh, what's going on here. Unfortunately, you can't see that. It's it's very difficult to see that because you you need to have microscopes and and it's not even possible to see directly with microscope. You need to uh, use other detect uh, detectors. So, how far have we come? Because um, um, we haven't created life yet, then you probably have, uh, would have heard about it. So these are, this is a, a, a road map that we set out to do, um, I think the first time was about 15, 16 years ago. I've written many grants and um, I would say that there are many brave uh, program managers I pray to every night because they've been so kind and give us money to, to develop these things because it is kind of, uh, outside of the box stuff, where we are looking for for implementing or trying to uh, to make a, um, a, a self-reproducing molecular machine, but every one of these uh, milestones um, has taken uh, several years to do. And today, we are at a point where we have implemented the things that are in black, and we are working on um, the blue stuff. And I think we calculated here the other day that we've probably spent about 17 million dollars to get where we are today, and it's because it's not so easy to create life. It is hard. This chemistry is difficult, even though it's very simple. I mean, oil and soap and a little light, I mean, how, why is that so difficult? But it is difficult. And what we are doing now, we are using um, AI, we are using robotic, uh, robotics uh, controlled uh, high throughput screening to actually find the optimal uh, reaction conditions. And for those of you who are interested in, in the details of the chemistry, um, well, the, the, biggest, the biggest problem we've seen here, I mean, the, what's, what's really the hindrance is for us to, uh, to have this DNA to replicate with a high enough yield uh, without, um, uh, without having enzymes. Because if you want to create life from scratch, from uh, organic and inorganic molecules, you, need to, you can't have sophisticated biological molecules coming in. Turns out that uh, um, Julie Gibbs Davis group, they filed a patent here a few years ago for a, not a, a, a what is it called, a, a PCR machine, but a leader machine or a leader system, which is a, a called a, a lesion induced DNA amplification scheme, where you actually can do what we need to do. So we're working with her group to actually get these things to, uh, to work in the context of our uh, protocell, but we still need, you know, it's something that um, requires a little small village to make this to work, so we are out. I just sent um, funding uh, out here, a request for funding in the Euro for the Euro European Commission. We'll now go to DARPA and uh, NSF here. We've sort of been doing it across the Atlantic here the last um, 15 years, and it's worked out quite well. Now, 
I want to expand the story a little bit because um, I don't, I mean, as, as uh, for Neumann, the inventor of the modern computer, I do not believe that uh, life has to um, be implemented or is, is dependent in a crucial way on the material. I do believe we can have living processes that run in other, um, in other material, materials. And therefore, I've brought with me a couple of examples of how you can make uh, living or lifelike uh, structures that are, um, that, yeah, well, you can judge yourself, but I would say that they are close to living systems. I'll send this one around. This is a, uh, a slide. Unfortunately, last time I did it, somebody dropped it. Uh, just don't, yeah, please be careful. If you put it up against the light, you'll be able to see, to see uh, some, uh, some tiny, um, looks like sand. These are chips. These are solvable microchips um, that I think you should see. And then these microchips, they can then be controlled uh, via electrodes in a small basin here. You can then co couple this up to the computer. And if you s we send this around, uh, Felicia, can you just send it around? Um, so, so why are we making these things? Well, we're making these things because um, we would like to see how we can push uh, both the envelope of understanding what life is, but also because there are all kinds of fantastic uh, technological possibilities in, in um, exploring living and intelligent technologies. So these guys, they are designed to have an on, they, they have a little bit of, of energy on board, they have a supercapacitor, they can move, they have an um, electrosmotic drive, um, they can catalyze chemical reactions by turning uh, on and off uh, these electrodes. Um, it has sensors, it means that it can figure out whether there is a pH gradient and whatnot, and then they have a tiny a computer on board, it's, it's not a universal Turing machine, but it is a finite state machine. Uh, I have to say that we have not gotten all these things to work at the same time on these chips, and I'm, I will say that um, I was very happy that in this project, it wasn't me who was in charge of the engineering activities, I was in charge of the simulations. So I'll show you some simulations which has not, so this is not uh, stuff that we've done in the lab, but these are things that devices like these guys, when you let them go, can do. So here we have, um, on the left side, you, you, you'll see an XY um, uh, uh, field, and this is this little uh, basin that I've sent around. This is where you can put your chips in, and at about uh, eight by eight millimeters, and then you have a thin film of liquid on top of it. So since these guys, they can generate chemicals, and they can sense uh, uh, chemicals, then uh, if you uh, and they can, then, then if you tell them, they can move, and then if you tell these guys, program these guys to follow the gradient of these chemicals, if you throw a bunch of them in, then they will flock. They will simply make swarms, just like ants. They, so, so they will sort of say, be able to detect a pheromone, and then they'll be get, able to get together. Now if you program these guys to make more than one um, uh, type of, uh, of chemical, uh, then there's a green and a blue chemical. So then assume that the, the guys that are blue, they don't like the red ones and vice versa. Shouldn't think about politics here. But then what happens is that you can get these guys to simply move away from each other. So you can get the swarm to divide. This is not a cell division, this is a swarm division. And you can then, if you want to, you can then put uh, some uh, selection pressure on and you'll then uh, be able to, uh, to, if you change, the, if you have the programs being working um, in a little bit di different way, you'll be able to optimize this uh, division process if that's what you are interested in. So it's certainly this system, and, and but so, so for you to continue to, to have swarms that divide, you have to throw in, uh, not only you have to make sure that um, uh, the chemicals are, uh, that are in there, it, it, it has food so it can convert one kind of chemical into another one, but you simply need to have new, uh, new uh, chips to put in that can then be recruited to participate in the process. Another, if we, if we move away from, from, um, uh, from, from, the, from the squishy or from the, uh, from the, uh, the chemical stuff, we've also in, in um, uh, in, in my center, we've uh, developed, or we've been part of the development of a, a different kind of technology, which is based on, um, on Raspberry Pis. These guys, 
we, with, with those, we have made a, a buy-inspired information architecture for private, secure, and democratic cloud data storage based on distributed small network computers. And basically, with about $100 worth of hardware, maybe 110 but in a few years, it'll definitely be cheaper, you can take the cloud home. That means you, don't, you will not need to have these big data centers that will snoop in your data. You will be able to have everything at home, and you will be able to, um, uh, to, to use the network, the local area network, to actually connect yourself in small villages, so you'll have significantly quicker uh, retrieval data, retrieval times, and by do, doing uh, what's it called, replication of data, uh, then you can design your expected data lifetime to be as long as you want. It's not difficult to make these networks where they have a lifetime uh, comparable to the, uh, to the age of the Earth. And, and what's even better, besides uh, the complete privacy, is that they only use a tiny fraction of what the data centers they do. Today, the data centers, they are the fastest growing energy consumption, uh, consumption machines we have on the planet. And, and the CO2 emissions from the data centers surpass the global uh, uh, airline traffic uh, a few years back. So this is a big deal. But these guys, they run on, on about uh, three watts. So we can go down to about a few percent of the energy requirement compared to using the data centers. 100 bucks. Now, we, I would just want to mention another technology that we're working on. You've probably heard about uh, 3D printing. I mean, a long time ago, um, before 3D printers became a reality, uh, many of us were fascinated by um, von Neumann's second machine. Von Neumann was the guy who invented the modern computer. And everybody who has a phone with you or a computer, uh, that device uh, has, is based on the von Neumann architecture. But von Neumann, he also designed another architect. This is a mathematical machine um, that, that's actually implemented in your computer. He also designed another machine, and um, it's called the Universal Constructor. And the Universal Constructor is another mathematical machine, and this machine can make everything, including uh, copies of themselves. This has not been implemented yet, but there shouldn't be, and it's hard to implement, the, we've, gotten quite a bit of money, both in the US from, from, from government sources and, and in, in, uh, in Europe, to develop uh, different aspects of such a machine. And of course, uh, it's not difficult for, for you to imagine how wonderful it would be to actually have completely distributed control uh, of, of, of the manufacturing so you could make whatever you want at home or almost everything at home. So, so what I, I guess what I'm saying is that if you look at all these technologies, and many of them I haven't talked about. I mean, my speciality is, is trying to understand these simple uh, living and lifelike uh, technologies. But there is a convergence between uh, this, we call it the pink ecology of technologies, which in, um, includes the um, you know, biotechnology, information technology, nanotechnology, and cognitive technologies. And, and that's what enables us to have the internet and artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, um, uh, mobile devices, augmented reality, blah, 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 blah. All these technologies, they interact in increasingly synergetic uh, ways. And what does that mean? It means that these new technologies are rapidly moving away these physical technologies from our social technologies. Because our social technologies, this means our governance, our institutions, our, the way we have defined the market, uh, the way we have, uh, the way our educational system is, is based, et cetera, et cetera, our social norms, our culture. It was developed during the industrial era where it was a completely different technology that was uh, ruling the world. So what we have to do, what we're confronted with is a big challenge for us technologists to figure out how to implement and develop these new physical technologies in ways, in ethical ways, on the one hand, but on the other hand, also to, to figure out how to update, how to upgrade the social technologies so that they start again to make sense, or so that they fit with a, with a different physical reality that's out here today. And we, you, I mean, you guys know the story about um, um, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook and da, da 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 I mean, we could go on for a long time. 
that these are all symptoms of why why are the big companies are corporations why they're not paying the taxes that are fair etc 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 so so this is a big deal that as we talk about you know life and 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 these living and and intelligent technologies um, we also have to think about what it means to be human how it changes uh, what it means to be human so we will get back to or we get back to this one i think this is really the driver of uh, this new era, which I call the, uh, the Bink era. So then I just want to um, start with, or story, uh, conclude with a little um, provocation, because um, um, you know, being a physicist and, and sort of having a bit of a different perspective than, than many of, of you guys, I, it's been a pleasure to go to many of your presentations. I would like to see more people who are interested in understanding what consciousness is, taking the heart and tedious road going from the upper left corner, from the lousiest bacteria, all the way up along the, uh, the, the, the edge here, going up towards uh, the human beings. Because I think it's a little bit ambitious to believe that we, right off the bat, can understand the most complex structure that we know of in, in the universe uh, without having done, so to say, uh, the work uh, the step-by-step -step work uh, coming from the bottom up. Thank you very much. We can have one or two questions for Steen before the panel. One or two questions for Steen before the panel. I got one. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah, it is. Uh, the, uh, the hydrophobic uh, lipid-like interactions, we uh, are consistent with where, uh, in, in neurons, and where <clears throat> anesthetics act and are conducive to quantum effects. And some of us, and you and I have talked about this for many years, and I don't think we agree, but <clears throat> some people say that life involves quantum coherence. Any, any comments? Yeah, I mean, it's clear that, that uh, without uh, these quantum phenomena, like we couldn't have life, at least not with the physics that I'm uh, aware of. Uh, so, so the metabolic, or whenever you have chemical reactions and, and, and self-assembly, but in particular the reactions that are associated with the metabolism, the quantum phenomena, they are very important. Um, but I'm, I don't know, I, I think that some of the, the old guys remember uh, Alvin Scott, um, yeah. uh, bless, bless his memory. Uh, I think that I'm leaning a little bit, uh, even though Stuart and I, we're friends for, for, for a long time, I'm leaning a little bit towards uh, um, Alvin's, uh, Al's perspective that it's a dynamical hierarchy. You sort of, you, you build this, these biological systems, they develop over time and they become more and more complicated. And in part because of selection uh, favors, uh, you know, int intelligence and this ability to solve problems, uh, then you eventually get to con uh, consciousness. But of course, you, can't have con you cannot have consciousness without utilizing these quantum effects. But whether uh, consciousness is sort of a quantum phenomenon, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure out one day, maybe. Hello. Uh, I'm curious to, um, to hear more about your process of design. Why did you choose the shape that you chose for the, for the different life-like uh, apparatus that you're trying to design? Why did you choose those sensors? Like, I'm very curious about, you know, why matter looks like it is, you know, all the affordance properties of it. And I think we keep like just choosing very mechanical things that are limited by our engineering abilities rather than thinking more carefully about what will be the effect of the shape of the, of the object and designing many prototypes to try to understand these differences. I think we jump too quickly into building something rather than thinking about the design process to come with the right type of design. Yeah, so, so I, I, I completely agree with you, and, and I'm just telling you uh, sort of my personal history. When I was a, um, a young man, when I did my, when I went to graduate school, I, this was where I sort of was, I became obsessed with these things. And um, um, I was much more ambitious when I was younger, because I thought, well, we'll do this, that, and the other, and we should not be limited to the chemistry we know. But, you know, it's very, 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 very difficult to get money to do these things even using chemistry that's somewhat similar to, to, to chemistry we have in modern life. Whereas if you want to go out and explore new chemistries, well, then you need to find, find funding, you, not with a ten, tens of millions, but hundreds of millions of dollars, because it's just very, very hard. 
So that's why I would have loved to be able to show you a suite of, 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 uh, of very different approaches, but you know, I haven't been able to get all that money. Okay, thank you. So you're, uh, you talk about a coming era of uh, sort of personal manufacturing machines. Have you given much thought to how uh, we'll regulate what these machines make as far as safety? Uh, people just make weapons with them, it might be a problem. Yeah, there are all kinds of issues associated with uh, with uh, with this new future or this future that's that's uh, that's coming. And I think the, um, at the end of the day, what what we'll see is that this Internet of Things will be communicating with uh, everything, and and a governance structure for this Internet of Things is going to be the key issue for how whether we'll be able to keep uh, personal freedom and. We won't have you know, too big of a uh, divide uh, in terms of in inequality and, and, and we don't mess up the environment, et cetera. But these are political uh, discussions. I mean, I'm doing everything I can. I mean, I, uh, fortunately, the Danish government, government woke up here the last year and they actually have a disruption council where we're discussing, uh, trying to make, we, we're supposed to come up with, out, uh, what is it called, outlines for how to implement and develop these uh, technologies in ethical ways. So, so this is a big challenge, and, and, and I, I wish that um, I've been angry at my government for years, but I'm very happy that they've turned around, and I wish that um, so you guys have a little work to do over here, too. So, um, hi. You mentioned a universal constructor, which I, I, I love that whole theory, um, but I'm curious about how you're thinking about implementing it, because I assume that you have in mind like a chemical system that could build another chemical system. And when I think of things that are really universal and can build any possible thing, it's more like a technological civilization is probably the best approximation we have to a universal constructor because that's the kind of physical system that can you, build. You speak so loud, so I fast. I know, I know, so I'm sorry. That, it's it's yeah. hard for me to be on my tiptoes here. These are not designed for short people. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, so, so my question is um, how you're thinking about implementing a universal constructor and is it like, there's always an approximation. So um, I, I have this feeling that like technology or technological civilizations are really the best physical systems that can universally construct other things. But we have this tendency to think of a chemical system reproducing other chemical systems as a universal constructor. Um, so I wanted to know first how you're thinking about implementing that and how universal it really is. And if you see some role for this hierarchy that you want to build up built toward building human systems as being the real better approximation to a universal constructor. Yeah, I, I didn't understand your whole story, but but yeah. I certainly the the uh, it's well we we, we made in, in Europe we have the so-called um, every ten years um, turns out that the European Commission calls out for proposal to make uh, to make flagships. It's about a billion dollars. I mean, hundred million dollars for for each year. We had one for for actually developing a um, universal constructor for in a, to to make sustainable uh, manufacturing. We we they, we were told that can't be done, and and this was before people knew about the 3D printers. So I think that that we will see this develop, and I don't think there is a single technology that that is uh, that will um, at least we had a, a suite of technologies that we would build it on, um, because today, as you, I think you said that the, the, our modern, um, uh, what's it called, industrial complex can make everything with, with humans involved. And what we need to do, we need to miniaturize this so that you can have it um, in the lab or maybe on a, on a laptop, uh, like we did with computers. You remember in the beginning, oh, some of you don't remember, you obviously don't remember, but I remember when, when computers was the size of a house. And now we have computers that are much more powerful you can have in your, your pocket. So there is a lot of engineering um, that has to go into to making these things work. And there is all kinds of the gazillions of, of uh, societal uh, issues related to how to regulate as, as uh, some of the, the, the gentlemen said over there. But, but these, are, uh, these are challenges that I think that we as scientists, we have to take on us because uh, you know our politicians they they don't know they don't understand these technologies so there has to be um, there has to be some um, what's it called a little more cross cross talk let's have let's have just one more question please from Jean Pierre and then uh, we'll have time at the end for all the speakers Sorry. Uh, thank you for this uh, very nice presentation and I was st struck by the last slide 
and the divergence between uh, the physical and the social. So, so uh, could you speak a little louder? <laughs> this uh, slide where you uh, show one? the divergence between the physical and the social. Yeah, so, so sorry. You so already th This gave, one, yeah. Yes, I think this is a dramatic slide. It's a what? Dramatic slide, in the sense that... Uh, Dramatic. Dramatic slide, okay, yeah, okay. Yes, since uh, in the question which is raised here is whether in the political system of the free enterprise in which we are living, there is a solution for that. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. sometimes I, I have difficulty sleeping also thinking about that. But I, I will say, though, that humans have been in this situation before. And the last time was when all the Danes, they were farmers. It was before we were, we were Vikings. Later on, we became farmers. And, and, and then, at some point, people in England in particular, they, they uh, started to develop the, the uh, what's it called, the steam engine and the convoyer belt and all this automation. And that meant that the farm boys, uh, they had to go into, uh, into the city and there were horrible conditions in the beginning because there was no social technologies to, to, to deal with how uh, people were being taken care of. And there wasn't any governance structure. So, so we saw, so, so I think that uh, the way to understand history, at least the way I understand history, is in part to see how these new technologies, they force these old structures, our old institutions to, to break up and reform in different ways. So I hope that we, um, if we put our mind to it, and uh, then we'll be able to do it. But as you know better than me, uh, that uh, there, was a, there were many wars before it actually happened. And I think that's really our big challenge. How do we make this transition um, without blowing up everything in the process? Okay, thank you. Sorry, we need to stop there. I'm sorry for you guys waiting there. But uh, as I said, let's sta thanks, Dean, for great talk. And uh, we'll have time for a panel uh, a little bit later. Um, so the next speaker, Stuart Kaufman, where is he? Come on up. Uh, is another guy I've known for a long time. Uh, Stuart Kaufman is well-known uh, MacArthur Fellow and has been at the Santa Fe Institute, now at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. And uh, he will speak on the emergence and evolution of life beyond physics. Stuart Kaufman. Thank you. Thank you. This is set for Steen. He's a Viking. I'm not. Um, thank you, Stuart. The Earth is something like four and a half billion years old. The earliest signs of life are something like 3.8 billion years ago. There was a period of an intense infall onto the early planet that would have precluded life's formation for several hundred million years. Life started somehow within 100 million to 200 million years after the infall, as a crude estimate. That means that it cannot be, incre it cannot be incredibly hard for life to start, whatever incredibly hard means. Um, the other, the other overarching thing to think about is the following. There's, there's an estimated 10 to the 22 stars in the known universe. It's estimated that 10 to 50% of them have solar systems. So there's something like 10 to the 22 planetary systems. If life can arise relatively easily, life and biospheres are rampant in the universe. And I find that just an astonishing image. It was captured, of course, in Star Trek. But we all know that. Now, what I want to do um, is I want to, I want to try to talk about the following stuff. Beyond physics, the origin and evolution of life. I may or may not have time to tell you the beyond physics part. I hope that I do. We're going to get to this in a moment. This is a collectively autocatalytic set and I will get to it in around seven or eight minutes. But it's my idea about how molecular reproduction may have started. Bear in mind that none of us knows how life started. So what you will hear from all of us and anybody you listen to on the topic are ideas and some experiments. So I will give you a set of ideas and some experiments. So I'm going to start with the following. Um, 
I'm building towards an absolutely brilliant set of ideas by two young French scientists, um, uh, Maël Monteville and Matteo, Matteo Mosio, that they call constraint closure. So I'm going to begin with the following. What is work in classical physics? It's force acting through a distance right here. Now, Peter Atkins came along in a book on the second law of thermodynamics and added something very interesting to it. He said, no, no, no. Work is a thing. It is the constrained release of energy into a few degrees of freedom. So you can see it here in my canon. You can tell that it's a canon because I've labeled it canon. That's, I promise you that's a clue. It's, it's not a screwdriver. Honestly, it's a canon. And that's a cannonball. Where did it go, right there? There's a cannonball. You can tell because it says cannonball. And there's a little sliver of space where the powder is, and the powder explodes, and the cannonball shoots out the cannon. Well, what are the constraints on the release of energy? It's the cannon. The cannon has the property that it constrains the explosion from expanding in three space to expand and, and expel the cannonball down the tube or the barrel of the cannon. So the cannon itself is the constraint on the release of energy, and thermodynamic work is done on the cannonball. And the other thing to say about the cannon is it's the boundary condition on this process. It's the fixed boundary condition. We'll come back to that. Now, I call this non-propagating work because all that happens, I'm d demonstrating my knowledge of physics, is that the is that the cannonball hits the ground and it makes a hole and some hot dirt. So that's, that's, it's not propagating work. I'll show you propagating work in a moment. So Mal and Matteo diagram this as follows. The cannon is the constraint on the release of the powder explosion energy into a few degrees of freedom. A degree of freedom is, is roughly one of the possibilities. So, the explosion does not expand in all directions in three space. It just explodes down the cannon, which is only a few degrees of freedom. So, so they show it as follows. A goes into an at sign because it's what I had on my computer, meaning a process. So this is a non-equilibrium process. A goes to B. It's the powder exploding. C is the constraint. It is the cannon that is a constraint on this explosion such that the cannon uh, ball uh, is blown out the cannon. So the constrained non-equilibrium process fires the cannon ball. Well, that's fine. Um, so we don't have work. We don't have thermodynamic work unless we have constraints on a non-equilibrium process that releases the energy into a few degrees of freedom. But then I, I thought a few years ago, wait a minute, where did, exactly where did the cannon come from since the Big Bang? The Big Bang didn't start with cannons. It started with hot cork glue on soup. Well, it takes work to make the cannon. Somebody had to make the cannon. And it takes work to make the cannonball. And it takes work to assemble the cannonball inside the cannon and to assemble the powder between the cannon and the cannonball. So it takes work to make constraints. And it takes constraints to make work. Roughly speaking, too strongly stated, no constraints, no work, no work, no constraints. I'll call this the work constraint cycle. I think that's too strong. It's clear that you cannot get work without constraints. You may be able to get constraints without doing work. Uh, for example, I can imagine a hot magma in a, in a, a volcano that cools to make tube-like structures that could serve to constrain the flow of, of, of lava. Uh, and that might not take work. Anyway, I want to get across the idea, no constraints, no work. Often, often, no work, no constraints. So I, a number of years ago, in a book of mine called Investigations, I invented something that I'm extraordinarily proud of. You, you, it's got the same cannon. You see right here? You can, it's still a cannon. It says cannon. And it's still a cannonball. But I went out and I dug a well, and I erected a paddle wheel over the well. And I put a bucket down in the well that's filled with water, and I tied a red rope uh, from the bucket up to the axle of the paddle. It has to be red. A blue rope won't work. It has to be, <laughs> has to be red. You, you see, you're technically more savvy than I am. You know that a blue rope will work. 
Okay. And what happens is that the paddle, the, the cannon fires the cannonball, which comes out, it hits the paddle wheel, makes the paddle wheel spin, which winds up the rope on the axle, which comes over the axle, that tilts over and dumps water into the, into the tube that comes down and opens the flap valve and it waters my bean field. 35 years ago, the Milagro bean field war was very popular in northern New Mexico. So this is Stu's bean field. Now, this is propagating work. What's different between it and the former picture? Well, what's different about it is lots of macroscopic alterations happen in the real world. The cannon ball fires, the paddle wheel spins, and so on. Let's look at what are endergonic and exergonic processes. Exergonic means spontaneous, endergonic means you have to add energy. The firing of the cannon ball is endergonic. The explosion is exergonic. The firing of the cannon ball is endergonic. Work is done on the cannon ball. The cannonball does work on the paddle wheel. The paddle wheel does work to wind up the rope. The spilling of the water into the tube is, is exergonic, that's just gravity. Flowing down the tube is exergonic. Work is done on the flat valve to open it, and the water is released into the, into the, into the field. So we've linked lots of spontaneous and non-spontaneous processes, and lots of macroscopic changes have happened in the world. I want to pause and point out something interesting. Suppose at the end of this, I wanted to fire the cannon again and water my bean field. Could I do so? The answer is, of course not. The cannon has fired the cannonball, which is lying out in the field somewhere to the right. The pail is lying up on top in the ground. In order to do the whole thing again, I have to restore the cannonball to the cannon, and I have to put the pail back down into the well. That is to say, I have to complete a thermodynamic work cycle. If you link exergonic and endergonic processes, the system cannot do it over again unless a thermodynamic work cycle is completed. That means that if you think of adding powder to the cannon as feeding the system, there's no point in feeding a system that licks exergonic and endergonic reactions. Nothing can happen. You have to complete a work cycle. Okay. So this is how Matteo and, 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 uh, and, and Mael graph this. The first C is a constraint. This is the cannon. This is the cannon right here. And this is the paddle wheel, the second constraint. The first constraint constrains the explosion in the cannon such that the cannonball is fired. And the paddle wheel has an axle that constrains the rotation of the paddle wheel such that the paddle wheel rotates and such the paddle wheel rotates and work is done on the paddle wheel. So they show linked sets of non different non equilibrium processes in the little diagram that I'm showing you here. Now that's what I'm going to call propagating work. Every machine that you know, like a, a, an automobile, does exactly this. It just it's a graph that some complicated graph that's a directed graph that links non-equilibrium processes and constraints on the release of energy, where again, the constraints are boundary conditions. Well, could you do work to construct a new constraint? Of course you could do work to construct a new constraint. So for example, in the bean field case, it, m it might be true that the water is poured and flows down the hill to my bean field without going through the tube, and it carves a ditch in the dirt that ditch is now a new boundary condition. I can use the ditch to convey the water to the bean field rather than the tube. Work has been done to construct a new boundary condition or a new constraint. So we now get to this notion that I think is just brilliant. And it's not mine. It's Matteo and Mos Matteo Mosios and Mael Monteville. It's called constraint closure. I think they have found a fundamental idea about biological organization. What's going on here is the following. There are three non-equilibrium processes. This is a process, this is a different process, and this is a different process still. Each process is constrained, this non-equilibrium process is constrained such that it does work. The work done in each case builds a constraint. So. The first one builds the constraint CK. CK acts as a constraint on the second process so that work is done to build another constraint CL, which does a constraint on the third non-equilibrium process, which builds a constraint which happens to be 
the first constraint. That's constraint closure. Please try to take it in. It's a set of constraints or boundary conditions on non-equilibrium processes having the property that a set of work tasks are done that construct the same set of constraints. I think it's an absolutely brilliant concept. Nobody says wow, but it's wow. It's just an astonishing concept. Cells do this. Automobiles do not do this. Okay. Locomotives do not do this. Rocket ships do not do this. Cells do this. Cells achieve constraint closures. There's two fundamental closures that are going on here that I want to point out to you. The first is a constraint closure. Constraint one builds constraint two, which builds constraint three, which builds constraint one. The closure is the cycle of constraints building one another. It's a non-local closure. It's a non-local, non-mysterious holism. The second holism is non-local. There are three work tasks, A making CK, D making CL, and G making CI. Those are three work tasks. All three work tasks get done in a cycle. There's a non-local closure of tasks done, constrained by the constraints we've just seen, in constraint closure. So I'm going to suggest to you pretty soon that these two closures are a fundamental part of any definition of life. They're not sufficient yet. There's no molecular reproduction. But we will see this in our first example of molecular reproduction in a moment. So I've just said this. And this is a propagating organization of process. We don't have these concepts. Life propagates an organization of process by which it literally constructs itself. Cells construct themselves. They don't just describe themselves. They bloody well build themselves. Trees build themselves. Forests build themselves. The biosphere builds itself out of raw material. So we need notions from non-equilibrium science, and we need notions of constraint closure to begin to get to that. So please take in the notion of propagating organization of process. So this is to say that non-equilibrium systems achieving constraint closure construct themselves. Cells do work cycles to construct second approximate copies of themselves when they reproduce. Trees do work cycles to construct themselves as physical objects when they grow to form from seeds. These are examples of propagating work and propagating organization of process. The evolving biosphere is this co-constructing propagation, subject to heritable variation and natural selection, plus drift and frozen accidents. This is how the evolving biosphere physically builds itself and evolves. Well, we haven't gotten to reproduction and we haven't gotten to heritable variation, which we'll turn to in a moment. We're beginning to instantiate vitalism. I don't want to spend time on it, but I think that we are. Now, I want to now get to molecular reproduction. I showed you an autocatalytic set at the beginning. Here's the central idea. Um, what does it take to get molecular reproduction? There's two very different basic ideas. One is template replicating RNA which dominates the American view of the origin of life. It's called the RNA world. And the idea is that you have an RNA molecule that is able to copy itself by template replication, and it forms, if you will, a nude replicating gene. That may be right. Nobody's made one yet, but people may make one, and we can talk about that. The other idea is the following. Um, we have two Stuarts uh, and, 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 and Steen. So let's take three of us. An autocatalytic set is the following. I catalyze a reaction that forms Stuart Hameroff out of Stuart Hameroff parts. To catalyze means to speed up a chemical reaction. So I catalyze a reaction that builds Stuart out of Stuart's parts. Stuart catalyzes a reaction that builds Steen out of Steen parts, namely it speeds up the reaction making Steen, and Steen catalyzes a reaction that builds this Stuart, Stuart Coffin, out of Stuart parts. That's a collectively autocatalytic set made, for example, of small proteins called peptides or RNA molecules or some other molecules. It's going to have another closure. It's catalytic closure. There's a closure in me catalyzing Stuart Hameroff's formation. Stuart's doing it for Steen, and Steen's doing it for me. No molecule here catalyzes its own formation. It's a collective property. We're going to see that these exist. They've been made experimentally. And they realize all three closures that I've talked about. 
constraint closure, work task closure, and catalytic closure. And I think that goes a long way to defining what is necessary for life. Not all of it, but a lot of it. So how are we going to get, how are we going to get collectively autocatalytic sets? Um, so the basic idea is I need a set of molecules, I need a food set of molecules, and I need a reaction network such that each member of the set has a last step in its formation catalyzed by at least one member of the set. So I catalyze the formation of Stewart, Stewart does for Steen, and Steen does for me. I need a set of molecules having a closure property that everybody catalyzes, everybody gets its formation catalyzed by somebody. You get the basic idea? Now, now the big thing is then, well, that, that'll do. Okay, so, so I want to begin, uh, I want to begin by tuning your intuitions using the ideas by Erdos and Renier in 1959 and 1960. It's, it's a, number, a large number of buttons and threads on the floor. So, restart now, pick a time, remind me tomorrow. I'm going to... That was a minor triumph, thank you. <laughs> so, here's the basic idea. Take a thousand buttons and put them on the floor. Take a spool of red thread. It has to be red, otherwise it doesn't work. Same thing with the rope. I don't know where red comes from. It's, it's that in consciousness studies, we, always about, we have red qualia. Okay, so blue doesn't work for consciousness studies. Okay, and it doesn't work. So red thread. Break off a piece of red thread, pick two buttons at random and tie them together and put them down on the floor. At random, pick up another pair of buttons, take a piece of red thread and tie them together and put them on the floor. Just keep doing that. That's what's called a random graph. A graph is a bunch of buttons tied together by a bunch of threads, or more generally, a bunch of vertices joined together by a bunch of edges. And you can see up here what happens. And the intuition I want you to take away is, if you connect enough buttons by enough threads at random, all of a sudden almost everything gets connected. Okay, it's called the giant component in a random graph. And you can see it here. Uh, there are beautiful theorems that say by the time that the ratio of threads to buttons, is it threads to buttons, is a half. When the ratio of threads to buttons is a half, the number of ends of threads is twice the number of threads. So at that point, there's the same number of ends of threads as there are buttons, and a phase transition happens, and you get a big connected structure called the giant component in a random graph, and then it gets more and more connected as you add more and more edges. So I want you to get the intuition from this. If you connect enough things together at random, all of a sudden everything goes connected. Theorem. Okay. So here's basically what goes into this binary polymer model. Let me say it kind of slowly. Molecules are modeled as binary strings, like 1110 is a molecule, or 100010 is a molecule. Reactions are of two kinds. Two binary strings can ligate together to make a longer string. So 111 could add to 000 to make 111000. There are ligation reactions, so there are cleavage reactions. 111000 could break apart to 1110 and 00. Okay? Write down the graph that shows all of that. Then I would like to know what polymers catalyze what reactions. But of course, I don't know what polymers catalyze what reactions. So in the first simplest version of this model, I just assumed any polymer has a probability P, one in a million, of catalyzing any reactions. Call that P catalysis. The theorem is the following. When the longest polymers in the system get to be large enough, let the longest polymer be 10 or 15 or 20 or 25, what happens as the length of the longest polymer goes up is that there are more polymers, but there's a lot more reactions than there are polymers. And it is a theorem that all of a sudden you'll get collectively autocatalytic sets crystallizing in the broth, okay? That is the spontaneous emergence of molecular reproduction if we can interpret these as molecules. So here is one. So the binary strings of A's and B's are molecules and they're in circles. The little dots are reactions. So for example, this molecule, which I, I guess is BAA, 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 BAB, 
is formed by ligating together BAA and BAB, BAA and BAB, ligate together to form this bigger molecule. So that, and that little dot is a reaction. This is what's called a bipartite graph. There are two kinds of things in it, reactions and molecules. Every reaction has molecules coming into it and out of it, and every molecule goes into and out of reactions. So it's a bipartite graph. And there's a third kind of arrow here that you see down here. This molecule, which I guess is AABAA, sends a dotted arrow over to that dot, meaning this molecule catalyzes that reaction. Those arrows are assigned at random, and this is a collectively autocatalytic set. Um, you can't see it too easily, but I, I guarantee you that it is. And it's fed by, because of the fact that the monomers and dimers come in from outside. So A and B, AA, AB, BA, and BB are added from the outside. So this is a non-equilibrium reaction system. The image I want you to take away is the following. It's a theorem that, and it's been simulated now many, 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 many times. Okay, it's a theorem that if the reaction soup becomes complicated enough and you assign who catalyzes what reaction more or less at random, at some complexity, a collectively autocatalytic set will swarm into existence. I believe that this means that the origin of molecular reproduction is easy, not hard. It's easy, not hard. I'm gonna show you in a minute that these exist. Nobody has made them out of random polymers yet, but we're trying. But let me show you that they exist. So this is 4B. Um, Goran Ashkenazi has a nine peptide collectively autocatalytic set. This means something terribly important. There's nine little peptides. One catalyzes the formation of two, two catalyzes the formation of three, and nine catalyzes the formation of one. This means that little proteins can reproduce. This means that you do not have to have template replicating DNA or template replicating RNA to get molecular reproduction. The claim that you do is simply false. Just false, throw it away. That, that doesn't mean that it won't work making RNA molecules in, in the nude replicating gene hypothesis, but it's not necessary. Collectively autocatalytic sets are made from RNA, they've been made from DNA, they've been made from proteins. Niles Lehman has done a brilliant experiment in which he takes about 15 ribozymes that are RNA molecules that like to catalyze reactions. He's cut each in half, separating the catalytic site from the recognition site. He put them in a pot with magnesium for some reason. They spontaneously form collectively autocatalytic sets. So the spontaneous formation of collectively autocatalytic sets is a done deal experimentally. Nobody's made them yet out of libraries of random DNA, random RNA, random peptides or mixtures of both or something else. But uh, a group of us is working on it and we hope that we'll uh, achieve it. Now 4C, I want to show you that Gonan Ashkenazi's set achieves the three closures. The nine peptides are linked cyclically. Each catalyzes the reaction forming the second copy of the next peptide. The next copy of each peptide is formed in a reaction among two fragment peptides, which when ligated together form the new second copy. This reaction remains a non-equilibrium process if the two fragments are supplied exogenously as food. Each such reaction is catalyzed by the prior peptide in the nine peptide cycle. The catalyzing peptide does thermodynamic work to bind the two fragments, forming the next peptide in the cycle, hence catalyzes that reaction uh, by lowering the energy barrier for the reaction. That reaction is energy released and it's a constrained way that does work and you can prove that work's been done because a new peptide bond has been formed. So Godin's set realizes the constraint closure that, that, that we talked about before because each peptide is the constraint on the reaction that it catalyzes. It realizes a cycle of work closure of the kind that we talked about because it's in the nine reactions that happens and it achieves catalytic closure because the nine peptides mutually catalyze one another's formation. All three closures are achieved by Gonan's set. So I wanted you to see that. Stuart, what time do I have till? What happened to Stuart? Oh, I've got three minutes. Okay, uh, I'm going to just say this rapidly. Where did we get a connected metabolism? Your metabolism has thousands, uh, maybe a thousand kinds of small molecules that convert into one another. 
And the, all, all of the reactions are catalyzed by enzymes. So nobody knows. And I don't have time to show you this. I want to jump to uh, Dave Deemer and Bruce Damer's work to end. But the basic idea is that getting a connected metabolism is the button thread phase transition. If you have enough peptides catalyzing enough reactions, you will simply get a connected metabolism among those small molecules. And so that's it. That's a connected percolating component where the red lines are catalyzed reactions. Um, and it, it percolates, and it's the same as the red threads. So here's what I want. I want my autocatalytic set to catalyze the reactions in the connected metabolism. You see this here with the yellow arrows coming out of the autocatalytic set. But I want the connected metabolism to help the autocatalytic set by feeding it so that the metabolism makes stuff for the set and the set catalyzes the reactions. I'm trying to put together the following things, getting molecular reproductions of polymers, getting a metabolism going, which I'm sketching for you in about a minute and a quarter, and gluing the two together such that the set helps the metabolism and the metabolism helps the set by these green and yellow arrows. And then let it make lipids. And if it makes lipids, then you will get a liposome. A liposome, and, and therefore the liposome can surround the autocatalytic set and the metabolism to make a first protocell. So a liposome is the following, and you'll hear about more of it from Bruce. If you take lipids and put them in the water, they spontaneously form surfaces called bilipid membranes. And the bilipid membranes form something like soap bubbles, except that they're, they're bilipid bubbles called liposomes or multilamellar liposomes, and they're really easy to make. And anybody who thinks about the origin of life wants to take something like what I've shown you and put inside a dividing liposome to get a protocell. Liposomes have been shown, and you'll hear more about it from Bruce, to be capable of growing and dividing. Uh, and so here's, here's the, the first protocell. Uh, and it takes in food. It, it excretes. You can see the technical term poop. Okay. It makes lipids so it can make a bounding membrane, and it's linked together a molecular reproducing set of polymers and a connected catalyzed metabolism. Now, do I know that that can happen? Of course I don't. Do I think it's plausible that we can make it in the next 20 or 30 years? Yeah, I do think it's plausible that we can make it in the next 30 years. And I want to end on the following. We're making the transition from the animate, from the inanimate to the animate word with the onset of agency and we're going to want consciousness pretty soon. So a molecular autonomous agent I claimed in my book, Investigations, is a system that can reproduce itself and do at least one thermodynamic work cycle. Ashkenazi's nine peptide autocatalytic set is already a minimum autonomous agent because it does something. He doesn't do a thermodynamic work cycle. It does a cycle of work. But it's not hard to make it do a work cycle. How's in a liposome as a reproducing cell with a connected metabolism and reproducing doing work cycles this is a minimal molecular autonomous agent. Then I want to get to just the next slide, the next point. Suppose that you have a protocell, and the protocell is living in its world. The capacity of that protocell to sense its environment, evaluate it, it's good or bad for me, make a choice and act on that choice, would be of enormous selective advantage. So I think, and my wife Catherine Peel thinks also, very soon after you have something like protocells, you get the onset of agency in the sense of being able to evaluate the world, choose to act on it reliably, uh, and, and you're on your way. At that point, you might want to say that that protocell is aware of its world. And if consciousness arises early, it could be there. Thank you. My phone died. What? My phone died. What? My phone died. Oh, okay. All right, uh, thank you very much, Stuart. That was a great uh, question over there. Uh, maybe uh, Sarah can come on up. We can fix your computer while we take a few questions. Yes. If a 3D printer can print a 3D printer, does that make the 3D printer a life form? <laughs> Is a 3D printer a life form? If the 3D, 3D printer can print a 3D printer, does that make a 3D printer a life form? I hear you. I don't know, but somehow I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, the 3D printer 
I think you need to achieve the. I think you need to achieve the three closures that I said. You need to have something like catalytic closure, uh, constraint closure, and work cycle, or you know, a cycle of work closures. I think you need the three closures to have life, and you need to house it in something. And I, I have never thought about a 3D printer, so with hesitations, not knowing what I'm saying for sure, I, I'm going to say no. My printer thinks it is. But I may is. be wrong. <laughs> uh, you say that your protocell takes in food. Yes. But what if you reconfigured that idea as choosing food, making a choice of yes. food? And if you then did that, wouldn't the natural selection of those choice processes eventually lead to higher life forms? Yes. So uh, imagine that you can get this system to make a choice. The choice might be a classical physical system and therefore not, 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 not free will because it's classical system, it's deterministic. Right. It might be stochastic. It might be, it might be I, I want to claim that free will is associated with quantum measurement, so who knows. But if it can, quotes, make a choice, this is good for me or bad for me, it evaluates the world, says it's good for me or bad for me, then selection can act on the choice made. And, and the selection choice, does act on the choice made. And the choice making system. That and made the choice making choice. system. Of course and it I, does. I and sent you, you a paper that articulates this whole sequence. What? I sent you a paper that articulates that whole sequence. Good, and I agree with you. Once Good. you can make Thank a choice, you. once a choice can happen, natural selection can act for better or worse choice making systems, yep. as well as acting reliably in your world, which you'll hear about next from Sarah. Great. Uh, over here. Okay, so we have the theory, which is great. But can you tell us something about the empirical support for the theory? You mean, what's the empirical support? Yeah. Well, people have actually made collectively autocatalytic sets. They've made collectively autocatalytic sets out of nine peptides. This is Gonan Ashkenazi and the Ben-Gurion. And collectively autocatalytic sets out of RNA with two sets of ribozymes that mutually catalyze one another's formation. The first collectively autocatalytic set was made in the late 90s by Gunter von Ketarowski of two DNA hexamers that mutually catalyzed one another's formation out of two, two, two pairs of trimers. And Niles Lehman has made a set of about 15 ribozymes that mutually catalyze one another, well, seven, seven or eight uh, ribozymes that mutually catalyze one another's formation as a collectively autocatalytic set. What is lacking is, uh, Niles' experiment is absolutely gorgeous. He used evolved RNA molecules called ribozymes, and it's brilliant. Niles and others of us are now involved in trying to make the same thing happen with libraries of random DNA, random RNA, or random peptides. But nobody is, the, the experiments are just starting. Nobody has failed because nobody has tried hard. All right, there you go. Last question, please be brief. Hi, in what sense, if any, is life informational? That's a hard question. That's the next, next talk. <laughs> the next talk. But, but, but just, just briefly, think of this as an autocratic set of peptides, okay, with a metabolism and a house and a liposome. The peptides each are specific for the reaction that they catalyze, right? You could think of that as informational. So there's informational closure that goes along with the catalytic closure, which is the set of processes that closes upon itself so that the system constructs itself. When you add in Monteville and Mateo's constraint closure, you get that the system constructs itself, it literally builds itself by putting together thermodynamic work processes and boundary conditions. I think we can define a notion of information all that way. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's give Stuart a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. All right, speaking of uh, life and information, our uh, next speaker is Sarah Walker from ASU. She's D Deputy Director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts and Science, and also the School of Earth and Space Exploration at ASU, Santa Fe Institute. And she will talk about bio from bit. Sarah Walker. Hi, so um, I'm super excited to be here. I'm sorry I haven't been here all week. I had to teach and I actually have to go to another conference that I had committed myself to before and I'm super depressed that I don't have more time to talk with you all. Um, but thanks so much for having me. It's especially an honor to be in this session with people that I've looked up to most of my career and are doing very inspiring work. 
Um, so just to give a little background, I'm actually an astrobiologist, so I think most of the time about life in the universe, but my background and training is in theoretical physics, so I am very biased by the perspective of a physicist, and I usually like to give that as sort of a caveat that I'm very aware of those biases, but I also think that there are constructive ways about thinking about life um, from that kind of disciplinary perspective. And so, um, so my goal is actually um, to tr really try to identify whether there are universal principles of life and whether we can use those to identify life on other worlds and if they're useful for actually quantifying the origin of life transition. And so those are obviously really big questions. And so most of what I'm going to try to walk you guys through today is trying to figure out how do we actually make those tractable questions that we can try to start getting at and testing and building quantitative theory for. So when I think about the origins of life, I think it's exactly the last question, where's the information? What is actually, you know, what is the origin of life transition? Somehow, information became instantiated in physical systems, and if we think about what life is, um, my view is very much changing all the time. Uh, actually, my lab group has meetings uh, once a semester where we try to figure out what we think life is, and it changes all the time. Um, <laughs> It's really funny. Um, but the, the idea is basically that we're used to thinking about um, a lot of ideas about life, but if you think from this informational perspective, you start to realize a lot of the questions about why defining life or thinking about life is hard. And it's hard because you're not talking about a single entity, you're not talking about a particular physical object, you're talking about a structure that's extended in space and time and is controlled by information. And we've heard it in the previous two talks that this information is reconstructing the physical world. And it's actually generating new possibilities. And so that, to me, strikes new physics. You might not think it's physics. It might be beyond physics. Um, but I think that there's, there's, there's things that we don't understand about that kind of process. But if we start getting ourselves in our mindset about thinking it that, about it that way and thinking that there's maybe new laws of physics even, um, that there are new ways about asking questions. So some of you might have gathered from my talk that it was a little bit of a nod to um, a quote from Wheeler. Um, John Wheeler um, had this great idea that all things um, physical are information theoretic in origin, and that we live in a participatory universe. And I'm sure everyone here um, is, is very aware of the role of consciousness in that participatory universe. Um, and I think one of the roles of life is actually, it is participatory. It's, it's about information actually interacting with the physical world um, and generating that structure. And so bio from bit is really the way of thinking about what is information and how does it act in the physical world? And so we can go back to a long industrial, industrious line of, of physicists and other people thinking about what life is. Um, a lot of people found Schrodinger's book really inspirational in the way that he asked the question. Um, and I think that um, you know, phrasing it in terms of the fact that we have a spatial boundary to a living organism and how can we actually account for it in physics and chemistry is a great way of posing that question. Um, and part of the problem is we really don't have an answer to this question still. So if you ask, what is the state of the field right now today in understanding what life is? Um, this is about the state of the field. Um, so I actually generated this word cloud um, from a paper that was, it was a really kind of interesting paper um, by Trivenov where they, they basically try to com compile all definitions for life, like 138 different definitions, and find if there was a consensus definition. And um, this is kind of populated by sort of frequency of use, and so we have a tendency to define life in terms of life, or living, or all of these kind of words, but, um, but I think this, this procedure of defining life has been really challenging, it's notoriously difficult, and that we really need to think more from first principles and what are the, the fundamental concepts about what life is and start from a theory and then derive a definition from a theory rather than having these kind of list definitions for life. And so that's obviously a tall order. Um, and Schrodinger himself, after pondering this question, had this great quote at the end of his book, um, which is my favorite part of the book, where he suggests that the laws of physics established up to date actually are inadequate to describe life and it might require other laws of physics. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what Schrodinger meant, um, but I do find this, this question intriguing about whether we're really missing something fundamental and how, how deeply embedded is life in the structure of reality and how do we think about these things. So the question um, that I'm, I'm just kind of posing to you all today is whether there are laws of life. Um, and so there's some interesting questions about if those exist, are they related to consciousness? Is consciousness a separate phenomena? Um, and I'll just pose that to you all to think about 
Um, but we do think about like the origin of life transition as being one where we had increasing amounts of information propagation, information processing, and eventually jump-starting this evolutionary process and the unfolding of the biosphere over the last four billion years. So how do we actually get at this kind of question? Or what is the, the fundamental concept of life? And I've already alluded to what I think. Um, and so, um, so people are variously obsessed with their hard problems. I, I, um, so in consciousness, we obviously think experience is a particularly hard problem. I think with life, you can, narr you can similarly reduce it to a hard problem, and it's how information can matter to the physical world. Because we're talking about abstractions, things that are not necessarily, you can point to a physical object and say it's a property of that object. But somehow they seem to matter, right? So we have conscious experience, we feel that intrinsically, but when I have a thought, it impacts the world. And you can write that off as a sort of, you know, an epiphenomenon or something, but I think that um, we really do need to take that seriously and try to explain that phenomenon. Um, so if we want to boil life down to one problem, that's it. And if you boil it down to that one problem, um, I think this opens up new pathways for thinking about uh, the origin of life transition and approaches that we might take to try to figure out what happened to physical systems when life arose and how we might quantify that. So I was really fortunate to have an amazing postdoctoral advisor, um, Paul Davies, who challenged me when I arrived at ASU um, with trying to write a paper of the one thing that I thought was gonna be like the real problem for origins of life. Um, and this is the paper that we wrote out of that um, after many, many conversations. Um, and so it's really getting at this idea that there was some shift in the structure of physical systems um, associated with information and how it's processed and how it actually controls matter. So I, um, so the hypothesis is information structures matter in living systems. And I'm gonna talk today just about three aspects of how we've been thinking about that problem in my group. Um, they're not all of the aspects. Uh, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a really difficult problem. Um, and I'm gonna just say that there's a huge, um, a huge number of people that are really excellent thinking about different ways um, information operates in living systems. And so I see this as a, a, much, a contribution to a much larger body of work. Um, and there was a nice paper um, in Nature by Paul Nurse basically saying that we need to think about logic and information if we really wanna understand organisms. Um, I'm gonna use toy models um, to try to illustrate these concepts. So I'm, I'm basically gonna suggest information, criticality, and causation are three aspects of living systems. And we might wanna look at those and try to understand how they operate, in particular, toy model systems. And so I'm gonna start with information, because obviously that's the bio from BIT, and what is information. But the first thing I wanna say is like starting with toy models is really important when you're trying to think about developing theory. And it's really hard to think about what are the simplest kinds of biological systems. So when we were coming up with quantum theory, um, we observed things in the natural world like the hydrogen absorption spectra and we made toy mathematical models for that and eventually we were able to come up with a theory of matter um, and quantum theory emerged out of that whole process and it was a long process. Um, and now we, we have really good working theories of matter because we had this simple model to study. So what's the equivalent for biology of a hydrogen atom? I mean, you can take your pick what you think the hydrogen atom of biology is. We just had one that happened to be a good toy model system for us to work with. Um, and so the one that we've been using is the cell cycle network of fission yeast. So you see a process in the real world, cells divide and they're controlled, their division is controlled by some gene network um, that, um, regulates when the cell divides, and that network has been worked out by others um, to consist of this small subset of nodes. And then if we find the right abstraction for understanding that mechanistic process, what will that theory be? Um, so, so this network um, is a, a Boolean network model. So basically what people do when they model Boolean networks is they take gene expression, and if the gene is expressed, they say its state is one, and if it's not expressed, its state is zero. Um, and so that's obviously already a coarse graining of the system, so that's why I'm saying these are toy models. But they're toy models that actually provide a lot of insights. Um, one, they're very tractable to study. Two, 
Um, this network's small enough to actually do information theory analysis on, which is not true for a lot of biological networks, although we're working toward getting toward bigger ones. Um, and it also captures a key function of biology. It captures reproduction through the cell cycle. Um, so, so this is, it's just one example you could choose, but let's run through the process of trying to understand how is the system processing information? What is it doing? If we're taking this information processing thing seriously. Um, so this is just to, to show you what a Boolean network produces. It's not anything too fancy, but the reason people get excited about things like this fission yeast cell cycle network are that if you look at the pattern of gene expression, so black again is the gene is expressed, white is the gene is not, and these are just the names of the genes. I'll get to what this control kernel is in a little bit. And you look at the phases of this, the cell cycle, this pattern of genes of expression that that little network I showed um, generates actually recapitulates what happens in living fission yeast as far as their patterns of gene expression. So from this perspective, it models the function of biology for this limited subset of genes. So when we're talking about what is the hydrogen atom that we're studying, the hydrogen atom that we're studying is this little network that has the function of cell cycle reproduction. And so one question you might ask if you're asking about information in biological systems in a biological network is what do I compare it to? Um, and when people do network theory, they like to do all kinds of randomized versions of networks. Um, so one of the ones that we looked at um, is a random network. And these random networks that I'm going to show you the results for were generated from our original biological network. Um, and they were randomized to maintain the same number of edges in the network and the same number of nodes. So that means the same number of genes and the connections between the genes are the same. And then we had another kind of network that maintained the exact same causal structure as the original biological network. And by that me I mean that the pattern of how many edges were connected to each node was the same. So for those of you that know about network theory and, and degree distribution and scale-free property, those would maintain the same global properties as the biological network from that perspective. And what we um, did with this is actually we did a lot of information theory on it. And so, um, so the, the nice thing about this network is it's very small and we can run the dynamics of the network and then we can generate probability distributions for calculating correlations basically between the nodes. And so I mentioned this, this point about life being this informational pattern distributed through space and time. And that the idea of information in this context is to pick up what those patterns are. Where are the correlations? Where is the causation? Um, and I'm not going to introduce causal measures yet, but we did use a measure called transfer entropy. And so you can look at the slide or you can listen to me talk. The slide's a little technical. Um, but the idea of transfer entropy is if I know my state now and I try to predict my state based on my past, I might have missing information. You might need to know that I talked to Stu um, before giving my talk, and he changed my state in some way. Well, he changed a lot of people's states in a lot of ways um, by providing information. And so transfer entropy basically quantifies how much extra predictability you get about the state of one part of your system if you know the state of another part of your system. So it's supposed to quantify information transfer. It was developed by Stryber, but a lot of people have worked on this measure, um, in particular Joe Lizier and Mikhail Prokopenko at, um, in Australia have an, a nice interpretation of it as a measure of information processing. Um, so you can think about it that way if you want to. Um, and so what we did is we applied this measure to all the pairs of genes in the cell cycle network. And then we did the same thing for those random variants that I just described. Um, and what we find is that information transfer really distinguishes the biological network. So shown in red is the fit real fission yeast network. Shown in blue is the ensemble of the ones that are supposed to have similar structure. And in green are those random variants that have the same number of nodes and the same number of connections. And what's shown here is the transfer entropy, and we've ranked order it by pairs of genes in terms of what pair of gene has the most transfer of information between two genes. It is not a one-to-one -one map between information transfer and the actual connections of these nodes. So this is over all nodes in the network, which is in part getting into the next thing that I'm going to talk about, which is the criticality aspect and the fact that there's long-range correlations in these networks. Um, so if you look at this, it's clear biology is not random, and it's not random in the ways that we varied it. 
Um, and so this is a very distinctive pattern to the real functional network. And if we actually sum that information transfer over all the pairs of genes, we find that the biology transfers just over eight bits of information through its entire dynamics, whereas none of the totally random networks got that high, and it was in the greater than 95 percentile for networks with similar structure. So clearly, it's somehow optimized for information transfer within the network. And so the next logical question is, how is it that that network that has similar structure to these other networks is organized this way? Um, and so what we ended up doing was trying to look at a, a small subset of nodes called the control kernel. And so those nodes are highlighted in red here. And they're called the control kernel because if you intervene on the system, you pin the state of their, those nodes to the ones that they are in the biologically functional part of the state space of the network, you collapse the entire state space to converge on the biologically functional state. So they control the function of the network. And so what we find if we look at the size of this control component in this network compared to the random networks is that four nodes is a lot to actually perform that function. In most networks, you only need to pin two nodes to do that. So somehow this control of the network is actually distributed. And more interesting is that if you actually look at that scaling of the, the information, so this was the information processing in the biological network, most of the part that distinguished biology from the random networks involves information flowing through that control component to the rest of the network. So one way of thinking about this in the context of the talks that we heard earlier is we've been talking about con systems that construct themselves. Well, this network is basically constructing its biological state by having information flow through this part of the network. So the main take home from this part of the work is just to say that informational patterns can distinguish living networks from non-living networks because of this particular regulation of function. And so we're actually looking at a lot more networks and realizing that this pattern is more general than this particular network. Um, so that's a story to stay tuned for. Um, but I'm going to switch over to criticality now. And I know a lot of people have thought about criticality in various contexts. Um, and there's this idea that life has evolved toward the edge of chaos, that um, there's an adaptability in being in this kind of critical regime between ordered and chaotic systems, which Stu pioneered and others, um, Langton and Farmer and, um, and lots of people have talked about. Um, but the, the idea being that if you're too ordered, you're not adaptive. If you're too chaotic, you can't remember your past. So your dynamics are very unpredictable. And if you're too ordered, they're too predictable. So what we're interested in is whether these gene networks are critical. And so Stu has been collaborating with us on this project. And um, one of the measures that we're using uh, was developed by him and Ilya Schmidt. I can never pronounce his name. Um, <laughs> how do you pronounce his name? Smulevich, thank you. Um, and so um, that's a tough one for me. Um, so they have this measure that they call sensitivity, um, where basically you intervene on the state of one node. So again, is, a, is related to the notion of control in some sense, where you, you intervene on the state of the system. And you flip the state of one node, and then you see how many other nodes are affected by that state change. And um, you can take this over the entire network and then may develop a measure of it. And if it's less than one, the network is ordered. If it's greater than one, the network is chaotic. And if it's exactly one, that means the network is critical, which means that it's kind of on the border of these two and you actually have stable um, dynamics, but that you, you actually can propagate fluctuations. And this criticality ends up being that you have power law distributions for fluctuations and things that you can also study. Um, but I'm just going to pr provide the results on the sensitivity analysis that we're doing. Um, and so we actually now have a uh, inventory of 67 of these genetic networks that we're working with. And they have all kinds of different functions. Some of them are implicated in cancer. Um, some of them are things like other kinds of cell cycle. Um, and these are just a few examples of those networks. Um, basically what we're trying to do, um, and this is kind of a theme of a lot of my group, is gather as much data on biological networks as possible and try to understand their informational structure. And this is not just for gene networks, we do it for other networks as well. Um, and so uh, the work that I'm going to present has been led by Brian Daniels, who is also at ASU and SFI. Um, and he has calculated sensitivity for these networks and a set of random variants. 
And this result is actually hot off the press, so we're still working on this. Um, and um, will be submitted in the paper in the next few weeks. But the, um, there are several random variants, just like we did for the information analysis that we've been looking at. So the red distribution is the real biology. And you see that it's squarely centered on being critical. And so what we wanted to know was, is that a property of networks that share any of the properties of biology, or what is it about biology that is driving that criticality? And so the gray distribution here has the same number of edges in mean activity bias. That means if you look at the Boolean functions for the nodes, on average, they output the same number of ones as the real bio biological networks they were derived from. And so if we look at that distribution, we see that most of those networks are much more chaotic than the biological network. So if we instead actually constrain not the mean property of that activity over the whole network, the number of ones output by the functions over the entire network, but instead per node, we get this yellow distribution. So that means that constraining the, the node level properties of the Boolean function gets you closer to biology, but it's not close enough. And so this was the part where when we were talking with Stu and he had this critical insight because he's been thinking about these things for so long and, and proposed this idea that GRNs were, gene regulatory networks were critically sensitive, that he said it's probably because you have canalizing nodes in the biological network. A canalizing node is one where you, you give it a particular input and that fixes the output. So one of the inputs actually determines what the output is independent of what the other inputs are. And OR is a good example of that kind of Boolean function. And if you do that, you actually get very close to the biological distribution. So what all of this is telling us is that the biological networks are not random, and their sensitivity is not random, their criticality is not random. You have to actually really tune the system to get the criticality of a real GRN. And you have to tune that in terms of the causal structure and the actual logic functions. So evolution is somehow optimizing those things together at the system level. It's not a property of individual genes, which is something that Stu has been arguing for a very long time. And, and this actually shows that. Um, so I'm gonna be moving now into um, talking about causation. Um, and so there's a lot of controversy in the field of thinking about causation. Uh, my own thinking is actually causation and information are the same thing. It's just whether you intervene on the system or not. Um, but, um, but I'm gonna uh, talk about something that probably some people here are familiar with because this has much more to do with consciousness studies, um, which is this idea of integrated information. Um, and that was obviously um, a theory developed by Julia Tononi and collaborators about a feminological theory for experience and how we experience the world. Um, and so the measure is basically um, aiming to quantify how much the sum is greater than the parts. And so that could be useful for consciousness, but you can also think about that as a useful way of thinking about life in general. And, um, and so I think a lot of the tools of integrated information theory are actually really useful more broadly for understanding emergent properties in living systems. And so the idea here is that if you cut apart the network and you lose information, um, then it was, um, if you, you have more information when it's actually a whole unit, then it's integrated. And so we actually looked at the integrated information in the cell cycle, and so this is um, big phi, integrated information, at each um, state of the cell cycle. And when we did this, we didn't actually really see, um, for that information analysis I showed earlier, that the integrated information was different for the cell cycle than the random variants. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I, I'd be happy to discuss why we think that's the case. Um, but if you do the full IIT analysis on the cell cycle, you still really um, pick out some very interesting facets of the network. And so I'm just gonna talk about those briefly as far as these networks having emergent properties. And so this was a collaboration that we did with Julia Tononi, Larissa Albantakis, and Billy Marshall um, in Tononi's group. And um, the cell cycle is integrated. So if you look at Big Phi and you compare it across all the different cuts of the system, you look at its parts, how much information they generate, or you look at the whole system, the whole system generates more information than the parts. And we've left this little node off here because this is basically an input to the system. It's not actually part of the system. So it's integrated. Um, the more interesting thing to me was if you want to separate properties of, so I, before I said the informational structure was because of the function. But in some sense, it seems like the wholeness, the things that are happening in biology, function is critically important, but I, it's, it's difficult to understand what that actually is and, and what the properties of that are. Um, so one thing we wanted to test was whether 
networks that could produce the same function would be equally integrated. And there was this example that um, people had worked out um, about a backbone motif structure for the cell cycle, which is this reduced network that produces the same function. So it has the same sequence of states for the cell cycle. And when we did the analysis on that network, it wasn't integrated and it had less inf information in, in general than the real biological network. And so that seems to suggest that it's not just the function of the network, but this integration and this wholeness is playing a different role. So, um, so, maybe, so living networks have these emergent properties and it's not necessitated by function alone. And I think part of that is the regulation of the function. The thing that that biochemical network is missing in some sense is knowledge about itself because it can't regulate its own function. If you, if you knock out one of the nodes, it's not as robust as a real biological network. So where does this all put us? Um, so I've given a few examples. These are all just thought experiments trying to get at some of these questions in a way that we can actually test and look at in these networks. How do we think about laws of life and what those might be? And so one of the things that I think about a lot um, is the origin of life problem. It's actually where I started with my research program and, and now I kind of spend equal parts time on that, thinking about life on other worlds and what is life more generally. Um, but I think this problem is really, and again, this is probably my physicist bias, I'm always looking for unifications, um, but that we have this idea of matter and information, and we think about these things as different, and they are in a lot of ways, but how do we actually build a unified picture of matter and information? What is that picture? If we had that, we could probably figure out the origin of life, because in some sense, that's when we really start to see these things, information really taking over the world. And so one way I think about it is, you know, if you want to study gravitation, you go to a black hole because that's where gravitation is most intense, right? That's where we study the limits of gravity. That's where we get the most insights into what gravity is as a physical force. If you want to understand information and how it operates in the physical world, you go to a living system. That's where that is happening, right? And so these are, these are really um, interesting times and exciting times to be a physicist because it's, it's, a just, it's like the wild west of physics. Um, so, so it's this hardware and software narrative, which I know a lot of people here are probably familiar with thinking about all of the kinds of problems we have with, with trying to unify those two things. Um, and so that aspect that I, I just mentioned is probably um, best articulated to me by this quote, um, that base metals can be transmuted into gold by stars and by intelligent beings who understand the processes that power stars and nothing else in the universe. So there's two physical processes that can do this kind of nuclear synthesis. It's us and stars. Why? Because we have knowledge of physics. That's information, right? We have information about the physical world that allows us to do that. And so those are two different kinds of physical systems. Um, one other point I just um, like to make on thinking about this is that life is not a level specific phenomena. So I'm an astrobiologist and, and a lot of people in astrobiology think about life as chemistry, right? Because if we're sending a rover to Mars and we're looking for signals of life, we're looking for chemical signatures of life. Um, but if you think about life from this informational perspective, information processing happens across all levels of organization in the biosphere. It's the hierarchy that's alive. It's not any in particular level. Um, and so these are just some of the systems that we study in my group, um, thinking about life as not being level specific. Um, and on closing, I just kind of wanted to, to talk about um, where I think this is going, and, and I think this is really related to the ideas that were proposed earlier, um, uh, is that that example of David Deutsch that I gave, um, where he's talking about us being knowledge, knowledge transforming the physical world, the example I like to think about is satellites. Um, the reason being satellites are an artificial system. If you think about planets, and you think about their natural satellites, there's not very many natural satellites planets can have. We have a moon, Mars has two moons, the outer planets have lots of moons, but if you think about iterating over that state space, it's not very large. If you think about a planet with a technological civilization, a living process on the surface of that planet, and in particular, if that living process has knowledge, it has information about the laws of physics, you have way more states that are accessible or possible. So stews adjacent possible. And so it's really the information, the instantiated knowledge that's constructing that process and generating those possibilities. And so, um, so that in some sense might be the biological era of time. And I'm just interested in how much of the universe actually transitions into this kind of physics. 
Um, so with that, I'm going to thank my sponsors and my research group, who's amazing. Um, and I'm just going to do a short plug for a book because I feel compelled to. But um, this is with George Ellis, who's speaking tomorrow, and Paul Davies. Um, and the main reason for pointing this out is that it's not just the particular reviews I put here, but a lot of people are thinking about these kind of problems in different ways. And this is an excellent collection of essays um, on people thinking about the problem from different angles. A couple of questions uh, for Sarah before. Uh, yep. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> Is it uh, relevant to your um, your line of thinking to remember that, or to posit that information isn't inherent in any given system? It's it's relational, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, rather than talking about, or rather than focusing on this concept of information, we focus on what elements of any given system has relevance to any other given mm -hmm. system and how they then connect and, and uh, allow things to evolve. Right, so is, I'm not clear what the question is. Well, I'm wondering about how we think about information. Oh, sure, and so, I, so um, yeah, so actually that's one of the things that I, I was kind of hinting at, that like I think that we have a tendency to think information and causation are different things. And what you're talking about in my mind when, you're, when we're drawing the connections between things and thinking that's a structure, that's like the causal structure. But it's really embedding the information and that arises from the information. They're, they're basically the same thing. It's just two sides of the coin. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, though, because yeah. I'm not sure I understand well, it. Th there are these two ideas that information is inherent in a system. Yeah. Or there's a, information only um, uh, manifests in relationship. In other words, any given system oh, or Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, I think it's relational because I think it's about the causal connections between yeah, systems. Yeah. I don't think a, a particular system instantiates information. It's only relative to something yeah, else. And there, and if, if that's the case, then the um, connections that do happen reveal something about... Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, Schrodinger said we might need other laws of physics, but you talked about laws of life. Mm -hmm. Are the laws of life laws of physics? So, yes. Again, I'm really revealing my biases, um, but I... Yes. I mean... I, I, th I think it depends. So if you talk about like the compendium of known physics, no. But um, but I think of like if you think about our fundamental theories like um, you know quantum theory or general relativity, we're missing a theory of participants or living processes or informational processes, and it, it would be on an equivalent status to those theories. Um, and that's why I say there's there you know like there are other laws of physics. There's just a whole domain of physics that we don't have yet in my mind, but I'm a physicist, so. So do all, <laughs> so do all laws come down to laws of physics? Um, that's a great question. I, I don't know, I don't know. I struggle with this question. I don't, I don't even know if I, what I, uh, because it's, it's not traditional physics. Um, I mean, in some sense, these are just labels we put on things. Nature doesn't make these distinctions. It's, it's just the way we think about the world. Um, and so I guess the more important distinction is what humans can do versus what we can't do. And that's where I would draw the line. And I, I don't know if there are things that intelligent systems can't do. What are the limits on that? I think that's a fascinating question. Thank you. Uh, over here. Uh, I was wondering if, you, over here. Oh, sorry. Um, if you could give us some insights about the relationship between criticality and IIT, as you have mentioned both. Would you say that networks who um, are at criticality would have a higher phi in the, in the IIT, and why would that be the case? Yeah, so I think that's a fascinating question. We haven't checked yet. Um, and I don't, I think there's a relationship at least between criticality and control. And um, because if you think about when you're measuring criticality, you're intervening on the system. And I think control is really rel related to IIT. Um, but I, actually, one of the things that we're actively working on in my group is trying to map out the relationship between control, causation, information in the, the traditional sort of Shannon sense, like the transfer entropy, um, and the, the causal structure, so, and the criticality. Um, so I don't have an answer to that yet, um, but that's actually something we're actively thinking about. It's a great question. Okay, let's just take two more questions so we can move on. Sorry, so here, here, and then we'll assume some panel. I, I'm a little troubled. <laughs> I'm sorry to get back to this question of information. Sure. O on the one hand, you say we have information about the physical world, and mm -hmm. you sort of equate that with knowledge. On the other hand, 
you are equating information with causation. Yes. What troubles me is the feeling that uh, you are in implying a rather dehumanizing um, and understanding of what information is. Am, am, am I simply, is my um, information simply a, a reaction to a stimulus? Is it a causal, uh, or is there something more to information than simply uh, cause and effect? Right. I mean, there, there are all issues about agency, um, mm -hmm. our own uh, capacity to understand. I mean, are you, are you saying that understanding reduces to causality? No, so, so one thing I should make clear is that nothing I think or try to do is trying to dehumanize or, or make, I, I, so humans are the absolute most amazing physical system in the universe that I know about anyway. Um, and so the idea here is to try to understand something about why we seem so special from the perspective of physics. Um, and in my mind, the thing that humans or other living systems do is acquire knowledge about the physical world to actually generate new physical possibilities. So the example of satellites is meant to illustrate that those things would not exist unless there was knowledge of a fundamental law of nature, gravitation. Mm -hmm. Satellites, artificial satellites would not exist. We wouldn't be able to launch them into space. Um, and so from that perspective, intelligent systems are the ultimate creative force. They're basically, it's a partic the participatory universe part, like it's the things that construct the world. Um, and so I don't think it's just mere we're getting information from the environment and doing bit flips. I think it's a, it's a very important part of the structure of reality. But that's my personal viewpoint, and so biasing yourself by those viewpoints is hard, and I try to be a hard-nosed person and say, well, what is this really as a physical system? Um, so. Okay. Thank you for that amazing talk. It's a fascinating topic. Uh, my question is, life seems to be, or, or nature in general, seems to be stratified into an incredibly vast amount of scales of time and space. Um, and we seem to have tend to look for life on our human scale. Mm -hmm. How do we start looking at different scales? And is it possible that the Fermi paradox is a result of the scale that we're typically limiting ourselves to? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's entirely possible. We have no idea what life is, and it could be all around us. Um, but, um, but I think based on this kind of picture, life can exist at all kinds of scales. Um, and so it's, and, and that's part of the part about it not being level specific, because we have this idea that life is a chemical phenomenon, but it's not a chemical phenomenon. It's a particular kind of informational phenomenon from this perspective. That may or may not be right. Um, but then um, in that case, yeah, we could be missing aliens because we're not looking at the right scale. And I do think that part of the, the, the Fermi paradox issue is that we don't know what we're looking for yet, and we haven't looked very much. So combine those two things, and it's not surprising we haven't found anything. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much, Sarah. Let's give her a good round of applause. The last speaker is Dr. Bruce Damer from UC Santa Cruz Department of Biomolecular Engineering, The Origin of Life and Consciousness, New Approaches and Evidence from Science. Bruce. Thank you, Stu, and thank you, Stu, Steen, and Sarah. It's all S's here. Uh, what I'm going to bring you is a lot of wonderful pictures and some cartoons, because it's late in the day. But we worked very hard on this to really try to give you a, a really clear picture of uh, this thing that's emerging, which uh, our group and our colleagues believe we are on the tail. We're chasing the tail of the first end-to-end -end testable hypothesis for how life can begin on the Earth, or might have begun. We'll never know exactly how it begun, but we're on, we've caught the tail of something. So. Let's see if this actually works. Don't think it does, so I'll just use the keyboard. No? Can you, uh, maybe the USB is not plugged in. Let's click on it. So while he's getting that set up, I'm going to bring something out. Great. 
It's frozen. Consider this when you think that AI is going to get up and, and uh, conquer the world. <laughs> you, you just have to, if, if AI threatens us, if Terminator 9000 is coming through the portal to get us all, all you have to do is, is wait for the log file to fill up with errors, <laughs> and it'll go down. <laughs> so we'll be saved at the last minute. I'm going to recommend that to Arnold for the next film. So uh, here we go. So I'm going to take on not one but three hard questions, but they're fascinating ones, uh, which were addressed by the previous three speakers. How did, the, how did non living matter become animated into the living world? Very careful selection of wording there. What does a plausible, testable model of the origin of life teach us about the origin and nature of consciousness? Because when Stuart invited me to speak at the last TSC, I thought, I have no idea about consciousness. I've never cracked a book open about consciousness. And it seems like a big, complicated subject to take on. It's like too big. It's like being in a forest and deciding, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll study forest ecology. Well, you're surrounded by trees, and you just can't see the, the forest ecology because you can't see the river and the, the highlands and the lowlands. You're just surrounded by it. So I, I, my whole approach is to rewind life back to its start point putative start point and try to determine what the properties were that led to the living world at its earliest point because it's the simplest system we can possibly study and then does that simply scale up and give us consciousness or does that teach us about consciousness so if we have figured that out or we have a, some good guesses about it how can we best utilize this new knowledge of what have, might have been our collective origins to create a more sustainable future because you know, heck, if we just extinguish ourselves, we won't be able to come to conferences like this anymore. So I'm going to take something out here, which I like to share. And I shared it, I believe I shared it at the last meeting. I think I shared a different one. But what I'm, what I'm holding in my hand is literally a piece of our common ancestor. This is stromatolite from northwestern Australia. This is about 3 billion years old. And these little textures, you can't really see them. I could hand this out if people wanted to pass it around. Uh, this, this, these little textures, these ridges, are laid down by microbial mat communities that's, that cement sand grains together, and they, they stack up. And this is the dominant fossil in the record of, of life on Earth for three billion years. These guys are what ch transformed our atmosphere and our oceans and prepared for soils, and they prepared for life. So this is ground truth, uh, this, this particular rock. The one that's on screen is uh, part of a new discovery from uh, south, uh, another part of northwestern Australia. It's actually hot spring preserved stromatolite, and we'll get to that later. But this one's 3.5 billion years. I broke this open out of a slab, and it was like, oh, look at those red nodules, new stromatolite uh, morphology in, in, a, in a barite mineral. See a little closer look there. Amazing stuff that this is even exists still. So where did this all start? Well, it started with a nerdy kid at age 14 without a computer, because there were no computers in our town. So I would do computing in my head. I would design board games, and, and I was an obsessive programmer without a computer. And I was walking in these hills outside Kamloops, British Columbia, Canada, at age 14 and thought, wouldn't it, you know, what are these beautiful flowers coming up? It's about this time of year. They have structure that is beautiful and complex, but they come from a bulb or a seed or something that's, that's simpler. But how did this exactly happen? Well, my little brain sort of went down and tried to run the algorithms of this seed or bulb. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. These all come from a single seed or bulb way back. And my little brain went back through time searching for the common seed, the first seed. And then something started to happen. I started to get some kind of a transmission. And you know, you're 14, you don't know what, you know, you've got too much imaginative juices, too many hormones too. Uh, but this flower was my question mark. It was a mariposa lily. But I had just read a biography or an article about this guy, Albert Einstein. And at 16, this guy was, coming up with, by doing thought experiments, uh, 
had a dream of run, running alongside a beam of light, and, and he could see the sort of compression waves in the light, and that led to special relativity. And I thought, well, that's the way science is done. You do thought experiments. So I started walking back toward the house, and this thing appeared in my field. It would be my third eye, or I didn't know what a third eye was. You know, I still don't. Uh, but this, it was a seething mass of molecules, and they were like a clump of molecules that somehow like Lego bricks had gotten put together, and they were sort of doing something. And I thought, oh, I can ask this thing. It must be a thought experiment. I'll ask it. And just as I was about to ask the, the bubble mass or the molecule, molecular mass, you know, how did it all begin, it asked me a question. It said, figure out how we made a copy of ourselves. And my little 14-year-old brain flipped into, well, you're a machine, and if you have an automobile, you need a big factory to make an automobile. I don't see a big machine around you. So it's not plausible. And it winked. Work on it. <laughs> so I went into computing. I finally got a computer, <laughs> PDP 1134 at the local college. Uh, it was actually booted up with a tape bootstrap. There was an option to do that. So. I started of study these, these bootstrap idea, like how do we get our system up? Well, we just feed this thing in and it starts up services and whatnot. And I then conceived of the, maybe the, the origin of life had to start with a random puncher, like a paper tape puncher. And that that paper tape would generate random program tapes, just random, and be read into a simple computer. This is a Altair 8800 from my collection in my barn of all places. So the computer is fed by energy, and the computer cycles continuously, pulls the tapes in, tries to uh, reads the codes, tries to run the programs. The programs are run in its little processor that cycles and cycles and cycles with energy, and the programs mostly crash out. They don't do anything, and they're thrown in the crash trash. But programs sometimes do something. They light up the front panel, and here's one that's program A lit lights on the front panel and didn't crash the system, so it's selected and it's appended with new random programs B, C, and D, extended. And my conception was that then, well, that could create a more advanced program, which it actually might sort of create the computer too. So now we have a screen and a keyboard. And say program A, C did the trick for that. Well, you go on and like, well, how does the computer evolve? Well, well, A, C, F, another random program, makes a laptop after a very long period of time and ACFI makes the smartphone. So this was a conception of an evolution of software and hardware together. Very slow and cumbersome and efficient, but it would work if you had the right system. So then I started to scratch my head and think, well, how does this map, if this is how you could boot up an OS in the, you know, randomly with no programmer, how would you do it chemically? Well, here it is, chemical bootstrap. So this fades into the background. What are the parts that we need to do that? Well, you need some kind of polymerizer that takes a source of your organic building blocks. Think of the, the punches in the paper tape. You need a source for that and some kind of magical polymerizer that squeezes these little building blocks together and makes these long strings to make polymers. And there are your programs. You know, we're all made out of polymers and polymers are cycling and building themselves over and over again in our, our bodies by their quadrillions right now. So where do the polymers go? Well, I then thought, hey, Darwin in 1871 wrote a, a letter to a friend that said, I, you know, I think that some warm little pond somewhere there would be a combination of ph phosphoric salts and energy and et cetera, and a protein compound would form and get more complex. Like, whoa, he nailed it. That is the fundamental insight. So here's our Charles Darwin. So our computer is a cycling little warm pool that's driven perhaps by a hot spring or by day-night cycling. It goes up and down. What are the programs? They're protocells. You heard the, the previous speakers talk about them. Little membranous compartments that contain the little random programs. And those protocells either pop or they do not. So here's our Charlie Darwin doing the natural selection thing. And they either survive or they don't. And this could be a system of evolution of software and hardware together in biology. It's real simple. It's like a nerd kid's solution to the problem. So we went looking for it. And we found it. 
and we found it in collaboration because you can't do anything without collaboration. And in 2009, I met David Deemer at UC Santa Cruz. He's one of the world's greatest membrane biophysicists, and he had discovered how to do this thing. So we, we made a partnership. It's been going for all these years. He came, basically, when I walked in the lab and I said, I have an idea of combinatorial selection for the origin of life from random things that are then encapsulated and then selected, he said, come with me. And he came down, and, and in the lab was this, like their first combinatorial selection protocell generating machine that they had just gotten built in the shop. And it works. So for example, here's, there's a little, there's nozzles here and the little dish is about 24 vials, and we, the, the machine hydrates the vials, and it dehydrates them on the other side. So the, it's the system's rotating these little dishes around so they, they get wet and then they get dry. And within each dish, he added uh, lipid of various kinds, and lipid is what makes your cell walls. You know, lipid is, we are just walking bags of lipid, basically. Uh, and a CO2 atmosphere, 85 cent centigrade, a pH of about three, a little bit acidic, helps things along. And it turns out that what happens is when the dishes dry down, you get these, these lipid, there's your lipid, and you get all these little building blocks of life, these little, what are called AMP and UMP, the building blocks of RNA, squished together in a two-dimensional world, and then they, the water then dries out, goes out through the, the layers, and they go click, 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 like a zipper closing you get poly polymers formed without the need for an, an enzyme, without the need for biology. This is probably the only way nature had to make biopolymers before it was biology. So it's like the chicken and the egg, right? The chicken and the egg, you can't make a biopolymer because you're not biological yet. Well, you can, you just dry the solutions down. And this is the reaction, it's called a ester bond or, or peptide bond reaction. So, what we did was then run all of these solutions through our, our gel analysis and these, these squiggly kind of dark bands show that we've grown, we've made a, a kind of a, a synthetic RNA in a four hour cycle, just instantly. And Dave invented a technology called nanopore sequencing. And this is little blockades formed when we have our RNA going through a, a pore. And this is definitive. We are, we're able to make these polymers in large numbers. They're all random. Between 40 and 150 little base units together, just, just make them, make primordial soups. Others are now making peptides. So this is now spread throughout the chemistry community that is working on the origin of life, wet, dry cycling. Wow, it's a pump. It's a, uh, like what Stuart was talking about, it's a ratchet, it's a, a system away from equilibrium. So here I am, 40 years after committing to work on the origin of life, standing in a very dangerous and awkward place in bumpus hell, uh, trying to test this not just in, a, in the laboratory in little dishes, but in the field. And this is in a uh, volcanic field in Mount Lassen National Park. We're on camera using up our last experimental tray that we didn't destroy, placing it into the fumarole vent, having wafts of gases at about 95 Celsius come over the trays not getting crud and stuff in the trays, which kind of wrecks your chemistry, just to see whether vent gases alone, not just hot water, but humid vent gases could actually uh, polymerize RNA in the field in a prebiotic analog, and there it is. Just a little bit of product, a little bit of product. And we'd actually put our solution right onto mineral chips that we picked up from around the spring, and they were, the surface was one molar sulfuric acid, so it would eat your genes away, and still worked. So Dave is a great believer, go to the field and try this in the field. It will teach you more than any laboratory work or, or theoretical work. Just go and try it. So we did. Last summer, we were challenged by a, a fairly famous geologist. He says, your, your protocells, your little bubbles will never work in a hot spring setting because in the, in the alkaline environment of high silica, they'll just get, you know, you can't do your organics in that. And in the clay, there'll be little floating uh, clay mineral particles and they'll absorb, they'll just take out all your organics like, nah, 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 nah. He's the front row question asker, this, this fellow Steve, <laughs> name will be remain nameless. So I said, all right, I'm going to Yellowstone with the field season and we're going to try this live. So 
Here's one of the springs we picked. And these are, if you've been there, these are wild. They look like alien landscapes, you know. So this is a silica a spring, alkaline conditions. There's a little silica gel coming out of solution and becoming mineral, becoming sinter. And there is a gradient. You can actually see this gradient of no life in the spring. And then you get this chemical eating life. And then a little bit further away, when the temperatures are low, you get, you get uh, sun feeding life and all the way down to green life. And there's a clue there. There it is a little bit better. And there's, there's green, uh, what are called endoliths in all of this center mineral. And there's me having scooped out some of this hot spring stuff, put it into the vials, and you're clearly forming vesicles in there. There's that milkiness there. So we had dry solutions of lipid, and, and we were able to form vesicles and encapsulate DNA and RNA in Yellowstone waters. We took water out of the ocean, couldn't do it, crystallized everything. It's, it's helping, in a sense, put the nails in the coffin for the idea that life can start in the oceans, because you can't make the polymers without drying. You can't make little compartments because the salt just crystallizes them. If you try to wash your hands in soap and seawater, it, it's a really funny thing, right, because it turns to curds. That's why the ocean cannot support compartments. Life needs to actively pump salt out of its system in order to survive in the oceans. So here's what it looks like in the lab. After going through these cycles, those little glowing spots are DNA encapsulated in the vesicles. And in this particular solution, we have a trillion compartments in one run. A little dish, trillion compartments. So let's take a look at the whole scenario. So here's our Hadean Earth. This is 4.2 billion years ago. Nice volcano. It's a very nice sunny day. You can see the dusty disk of the formation of the solar system, and planets are still sweeping through it. And our planet is like a vacuum cleaner going through the dust and and meteorites, and there's a you know, 100 million times more material raining down on the Earth. That turns out to be the material that's the feedstock for life. Fatty acids, amino acids, and even nucleobases are coming in. They're raining like, practically like snow, concentrating in pools on land where they can get concentrated enough to do the chemistry. And this ideal little pool is driven by a pump called a geyser, which tend to be, operate on a regular basis. And within that pool, you can get this magic happening a wet cycle, a dry cycle, and a moist cycle. Just like when you put solution bathtub uh, soap bubbles in your bathtub for a, a soapy, what is it called, bubble bath, it creates more bubbles, and then the bathtub drains down, dries out, you refill it, and what happens at the edge of the bathtub? A bathtub ring forms. And that's layer upon layer upon layer of lipids, and in between those layers, a huge chemical factory is going on. So this is our cycling system. This is our engine. So it's all about cycling. The system has to continuously cycle to continuously make new polymers. The other ones are breaking down. Encapsulate them in the bubbles, test them. And then what happens is you get this sludge that forms at the bottom. And it's like a community structure. This is where the network boots up. Because within this community of protocells, you have the possibility of having metabolic processes and Stewart's autocatalytic sets occur because the pond level is drying down, the sludge is at the bottom, and you have a concentration and stuff forcing through membranes, and a network effect takes over. So some is greater than the, uh, the, the parts, as, as Sarah was talking about. So we then had the insight that this sludge that continues to grow in the bottom of our dishes is our common ancestor. It is the unit. It's a communal unit using a, a, a kind of booting up chemistry that is the, the ancestor of the progenote, the Carl Woese, George Fox idea from the 70s of a boot up phase of life, and that we may have found it. And I went to uh, George Fox's office in University of Houston. We showed him the entire thing. He said, I think you are on the path to the pro progenote. It's very reassuring. So let's take, this is the entire model as presented last year at one of our major meetings. Let's go through it. It's got seven steps. Everything has to have seven steps, right? So this is the hot spring origin of life model. So we start with synthesis of, of, of a huge amount of our organics in space, a feedstock. You need a continuous feedstock. They come and they land, say, in our nice little caldera there in the various pools where organic chemistry starts to happen. Uh, you get enough concentration and, and sharing between pools, different pHs, and what, you get a lot of complex products like micelles. 
then perhaps uh, you get a feed stock thing into an ideal pool driven by cycling that cycled you know, for, it could be just a year or two, it doesn't have to be long periods of time. You get our cycling going and you generate the progenote. And as the progenote becomes more robust as a unit, it's distributable, that's the key. It can get out of the pool, can be washed out of the pool to another pool. Why? Because this pool's conditions may change. It may fill up with junk or never fill again. Or it can be blown by wind, not surprisingly. And stromatolite communities still distribute by wind. It's a widespread mechanism, dried biofilms, of early form of almost like seeds. So you get a combinatorial landscape of progenote communities that are sharing, developing innovations under different stresses and sharing them back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So you have a powerful evolutionary computational machine on this landscape. And once the, the progenotes are distributed into dilute solutions where they can no longer feed on the chemicals of the hot spring, they start dying. What do they have to do is when, when they can't feed, get a free lunch, they have to make their own food, which means energy capture from the sun. So photosynthesis, we predict, comes in early, and it comes in right at this point where, where you're leaving the, the chemical feeding zone. And then we predict here that the actual beginning of cell division, which can, can occur within a communal mass, is if a protocell's in solution, it tries a, the trick of dividing itself. Think of dividing yourself, you know, walking along the street. I'll think I'll make two of me. It's not gonna work very well. But if the, progeno if the protocells within the community structure and it just, a few innovations came together to make cell division happen, then you have the transition to the living world, but it can happen safely in the communal co context. So that's, that's a, the current thought experiment. So once you get robust, distributable microbial communities, and now these are early microbial communities, they can distribute and they head toward, they get washed down toward the ocean, they get salt comes in and starts to blow up their membranes. So now they have to learn how to actively trans transport the salt out. Once they've done that, they can globalize because then they can reach the marine shoreline, which has got incredibly high tides at this point, very, very violent in, in environment. The oceans are coffee colored, they're full of dissolved uh, iron. And so, but they can now globalize and you get this you get stromatolites that are visible everywhere in the fossil record. So this is what I mean by end-to-end. -end. It, involves, it involves so many aspects of science. So many colleagues worked on this for two years, on this diagram. And it was picked up by this magazine and put on the cover in August, uh, which we're very proud. We bumped the uh, eclipse off the cover, and uh, <laughs> we asked the editor why, and she says, I'm a microbiologist. And I think this is one of the most important stories we'll publish in this century. It's like, woo! <laughs> and they're republishing it in July in a special issue on 21st century science. So uh, what they did is they took uh, my drawings uh, and made this beautiful treatment of the landscape for the public with this spiraling system going around and around, wet, dry, and moist, wet, dry, and moist. They did a beautiful job. We're actually working on a full animation of this now. So guess what? This is the same cycle that's happening today outside. This is from my window, looking out from my window of my uh, room here at the hotel. And what's happening? A moist cycle is happening. Soils are still moist, springtime is happening, metabolic activity is, is cranking. And these little guys, these barrel cactuses, have learned the trick of, con of keeping water to keep that moist cycle going. Well, other plants dry completely down and have to make seed compartments to go on. So the, you're seeing the wet, dry, moist cycle, wet, dry, moist cycle uh, from the pattern from this origin pool, still in biology. And your body, biology, learn how to kick water out in between the, the stitching together of polymers and say, hey, yeah, water, you're in the way, get out of the way, I wanna make a piece of DNA. And that's called enzymes, and that, they used ATP to do that. So you have learned how to dehydrate yourself while being still moist. You don't have to dry down completely. So that's how one of the things that biology took over. So how does this actually help us look for evidence for life on other worlds? I'm one of the th I'm a, a team member, one of the three landing site teams for Mars 2020, an upcoming rover. And we're arguing that NASA should go back to this place, which is Columbia Hills, where the rover Spirit 
uh, its back wheel stopped turning at some point, and it was just about to finish its mission, and they used the wheel as a trencher, and they trenched up this white soil. And this is not snow, this is opaline silica. And they realized, we are driving over an old Yellowstone hot spring. We found it. Talk about needle, needle in a haystack on Mars, right? There's known hydrothermal springs, ancient ones. There's no water flowing out of them all over the planet. But we're, we're sitting on one. And it turns out that these, these rocks here look just like the digitate uh, silica rocks you find in hot springs in, say, in, in South America. So we're proposing that we should go back to Columbia Hills and break rocks because we may find something like this, like these textures. We have a shot. It's a very short, small shot. Because Mars went out of the habitable zone. And if there's any life at all, it's deep in the crust. But if hot springs are active over Mars's history, they bring that biota up and have it be active for periods of time on the surface. And they may lay down textures that we can recognize in situ, not for having to bring samples back. But we're in an uphill battle. There's three landing sites left, and, and we're probably third at this point. So what does this have to do with consciousness? Well, this is the dream that I did when Stuart Hameroff invited me to come to the conference. I asked myself, what is, what is happening at the boundary between physics and biology? And I had this dream one night, and I said, well, uh, is it necessary to have a guy in a white beard and a lab coat standing there at the origin of life as the first protocells are forming and say, I'll remove these carbon atoms five angstroms to the left? And the dream said, no, that's an unnecessary complication. It was a cranky dream. It said, let me show you how you were made. So here's the results of the dream. Thought experiments rock, by the way. So first it showed me the undulating plane of physics and said, push on one side and it'll undulate predictably. It's, it's uh, an entailed system. It's one of Stuart Kaufman's, like, you know, it's a predictable system. It's physics, you know. But then suddenly inside the... the the uh, undulating plane opens the first protocell, which has a, a transmissive membrane. And what it can do is crowd things together. By crowding things together, you end up with higher probability of things happening. So it asked me the question, what's going on? I think, well, it's sort of like a probability machine. And then it showed me two protocells, the dream, the thought experiment showed me two protocells with stuff transmitting between them. And it said, what are you looking at? It said, some kind of a message passing is going on in this system. And then it created a larger mass of protocells and said, well, what are you seeing? And I said, well, it's kind of nonlinear. As soon as you add more protocells, you get more transmission. And then it was a, a fan of Descartes. So it showed me these three Cartesian plots. And one of them was probability screaming up, uh, interconnections or interactivity climbing, and then asked me what the third part was and that's uh, information, that's uh, memory. So the whole system comes together as a machine that starts with probability, creates interconnection, and then generates memory. Interaction network, memory system. So what this is is a Copernican, potentially a Copernican recentering. Copernicus centered our understanding of the universe on the sun, but this generative system could center our understanding uh, and our, our fields of inquiry for all these fields. Let's go through these quickly. Political economy, how physics creates information, complexity theory, and AI. Is it an engine of creation? So my prediction is that this uh, fundamental properties generate, this engine, this system generates all observable phenomena and all felt experience, and that we're only just starting to feel this field, feel into this field. We're great instruments sensing this field. So here's, this is uh, the last part of the model, a cycling roadmap to consciousness. We start with cosmic cycling, this is two phase. We go to origin and early life, which is a three phase system because it, it can produce memory. Then we end up with neural dynamics, which supports learning. Then we go to consciousness and see how this goes together. Physics of the universe is on off, doesn't have much of a memory system. Add biology, you have memory, you have this three-way cycling engine. Neurons support learning part of the way. Get enough neurons amassed and you have a fifth cycle which is awareness of itself or conscious self-awareness. And perhaps this entire cycling system from physics all the way to consciousness 
when it becomes awareness of itself, looking at its own origins and evolution, it provides an opening for the experience many of us in this room have felt, which is the experience of a unity consciousness. So in answers to these three questions, how did non-living matter become animated into the living world? Through a three-phase cycling engine, no need for supernatural creator or pre-existing consciousness. What does a plausible, testable model of the origin of life teach us about the origin and nature of consciousness? Consciousness emerges from on the substrate of the living world and is characterized and couples into continuous cycling of probability shaping and interactive networks in a memory system. Now here's the, this will I'll wrap up with this, this is the, the real take home point. How can we best utilize this knowledge of our collective origins, if it is, to create a healthier and more sustainable future? I posit to you that biology's central operational influence on the world is to shape probability to bring unlikely objects and events into existence. So prediction, we can explore and formalize methods to shape collective probability, this field, for future outcomes. And just as protocells did this uh, for their survival, our conscious intention and attention can work in the following way, and this is the take home for maybe the spiritists among us, or the, uh, is that the future, from the present to the future, is valleys of likelihood and probability. And into those valleys, if we have an intention, we, we open the first valley, roll the stepping stones, that if we pick them up, they're actionable items. And as we pick them up, they open the future path of uh, synchronicities to start happening. And we get to an amazing future, like being here, uh, here at the conference. So you can test this hypothesis in your own life. Set an intention, pay attention, take actions and measure outcomes. And my own, this is a conclusion here, my own example, my own life, I, I give to you as a, as a test of this hypothesis, my relentless conscious attention on the origin of life problem brought a highly improbable outcome into reality. Starting with Albert Einstein, getting the thought experiment, getting the model that's now te testing in science. 40 years. The last question I'll leave you this, with this is this. What generated the thought experiment that I had? Huh? Where did this come from? Because we can't know everything, right? Let's leave something as a mystery. So the precise source of what we might call synchronicities, miracles, the muse or puppeteer, as mentioned earlier, mind at large or cosmic intelligence will perhaps always remain the greatest mystery. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's have a couple questions for Bruce. Can I ask uh, Steen, uh, Stewart, and Sarah to come on up? Uh, we have, uh, uh, we're a little short on time, but uh, we'll have uh, some questions. Can, thank you. That was uh, brilliant. Um, but I have a question. If uh, this process is so easy in a way, why do we all have a common ancestor? Why hasn't life started multiple times? That, that's, that's a big one, why we don't have, uh, why we have a common ancestor. I mean, there's people who work on that, and in a sense, it's the roots of the tree of life where you come into coherency with one genetic code and one set of tools, but certainly uh, the roots of the tree, the tree of life isn't really a trunk either. There was all this divergence. So uh, it's one of the great questions of biology but certainly early on everything was horizontally transferred and there was multiple starts and multiple failures all over the place. I mean, why, isn't there, why aren't there starts now? Um, generally, modern biology would eat them up and oxygen would interrupt with their chemistry. It prevents future starts. Thank you, Bruce. Great job. This is Sky Nelson over here. Thank you. I've seen your work a few times and it gets more clear each time to me. Uh, so I'm wondering about this idea of synchronistic evolution, which I think you hinted at. Um, instead of just pure natural selection or probabilistic or combinatorial selection, that there's a meaningful element or meaningful selection process. Uh, and if that's the case, do you think that happened at that first step with chemical evolution or 
Did it happen when uh, sun feeding began? At what point did we need a more meaningful synchronistic process to step in to speed things up? I think that as soon as you had energy capture, so the difference between feeding from hydrothermal energy, from heat energy and chemical energy coming up from the hot spring and, and capturing sun, they're really high, solar energy is very high quality. And I wanted to mention this for, for Stuart here. It's the first sort of connection in a sense with quantum effects and biology because when you're capturing solar energy, you're probably doing it with polycyclic hydrocarbons, which can bounce photons around because they're landing in from space. You have a high-grade energy coming in. And I think that that really kick-started the, the, the world, the living world. And the prediction we had is in some epithelial layer of a progenote, that's where the first dividing cells would have been. The energy-capturing protocells did the trick of division. And then they created this sheet of of fantastic productivity on top of the rest of the community and sort of the late progenian. Thank you. Hi, I'm Avtar Singh. Um, fascinating story and time history of origin of life and how it evolved. The question is, do you think the origin of life is same as origin of consciousness? I'm, I'm pretty much a gearhead, so I think consciousness is a kind of OS and needs something to run on. So I think that if you start if you, this, you know, the, the state of sort of conscious sensing in the world of the progenote or the world of microbial communities, which is 90% of the history of life on Earth, is different than when complex organisms, plants, and animals come. It's just different because it had to boot up very slowly and build its interconnection, build the OS that could run something as complex as our sensorium, even, and then our mathematics and our symbology. It just you need a long time to do that because you need three billion years to just get the oxygen in the atmosphere. Yes, yeah, so my specific question is, isn't there an element of our living uh, universe or consciousness which is guiding the processes which led this matter, inanimate matter, to, to get into a, a living body? That, that, got, that process itself that moved it from A to B isn't that process itself separate from the, what is happening to the inanimate matter? That, that's why in my dream, you know, I pictured the guy with the white beard. Did you, you know, because in a sense, any kind of complex system, an AI or a god or whatever, that could guide the origin of life would have had to have been informationally massive, right? Because it's dealing, in, in fact, it's implausible. Uh, that so, because the system is based on so much random outcome and so much tries and retries, I think a god would get very bored with the process very quickly. Uh, I don't think it's necessary, you know. Uh, 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 yeah, okay. okay, thank you. Why don't you sit down and we'll, uh, we'll take the questions in. Thank you. Uh, we'll open it up to the whole panel. But let me, let me address that, take the chairman prerogative to the last question, because I was going to ask the panel this, that a lot of people... Uh, neuroscientists, uh, Tononi, Koch, uh, who are no slouches in neuroscience, and a lot of other people think that are panpsychists. They think that consciousness is intrinsic to reality. And Penrose and I have a similar idea for collapse, so which would mean that con some form of proto-consciousness was present before life. Now, most of you, I think you would all assume that life emerged from consciousness, but you could look at it the other way around, in which case, uh, life uh, could have originated and evolved because of feelings, for example, reward. I mean, all our behavior now is due to reward, right? Uh, rats in a maze, are, we come to this conference for reward of different sorts. So is it possible that life originated and evolved to feel good? Yes or no? <laughs> you may be living in that universe. All right. Uh, all right. So. Uh, my question is uh, around the, the the projections that Bruce wants to to see. Like I come from a, a field of uh, uh, design thinking, so we do pro fast prototyping all the time to try to come with the best products, right? That's how the iPhone became the dominant one, as opposed to the the other types of products that have been for 40 years. So fast prototyping is very important in order to discard all the trash, but fast prototyping requires that you don't censor yourself and a degree of naiveness, right? So you allow that all these experiments happen. And my concern is that sometimes I feel that we censor 
ourselves too much by either theories or by other uh, biases, and we don't allow these experiments to happen. And we also, you know, tend to like, uh, like just basically not do things as, as you did. You went to the source, and I think that's the lesson. I, I, we keep doing this all the time, you know, in our in, uh, the design schools, like, just do it, just prototype, 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 and learn, and learn, and learn. And I feel like there's a lot of people who miss that opportunity of prototyping rapidly. So uh, do you think you, we need to stop with the censorship, allow ourselves to be more creative, and to create a stupid experiments? and to create those experiments that may sound naive and, and not, not uh, useful, because those will lead us to actually find the good ones. Yeah, that's, this is a big one, because you know, anyone who has a hypothesis that doesn't sort of try to test it and falsify it may fall in love with their idea. And certainly in product development, this happens. But there's an actual test. You, your company fails. You, know, you get selected out if you fall in love with your product too much and not test it with customers. And rapid prototyping is key. It's the, the way nature works. And so even in the spiritual and in, intellectual domain, if we fall in love with these ideas, the mind can create an infinity, infinitude of rabbit holes to go down. I mean, I think this is academic is, a, academia is rife with rabbit holes. And it's only those that are the brave souls that go out to try to falsify their approach and test it that don't basically live to the grave with their closely held idea and are actually able to evolve. And this is true in intellectual pursuits. So it has to come down to testing it in the world. You know, I don't know if I addressed the question. No, yeah, no, it's just uh, an extension of what you said here. Thanks. Travis. Thank you very much. Great presentation by everyone. My, my question is for Dr. Dahmer. You, you were saying that uh, uh, you were thinking that the, the process of uh, capturing and dissipating light was where life really got kick-started. My question is, is in the, in the really Earth early, early Earth environment, you would have had a lot of UV uh, uh, photons hitting the Earth. Your polyaromatic hydrocarbons are strong absorbers and dissipators of that type of energy. Do, do you think that that is a, a possible mechanism, that, that these polyaromatic hydrocarbons are absorbing them, dissipating them, and forming some sort of dissipative structure to, to retain them, in, as opposed to having... Um, uh, yeah, that's... Degradating effects? It, it, precisely. Um, and in fact, uh, it, for years it used to be believed in our field that high ultraviolet was detrimental because if you, know, if you go out, in this, especially out here, and you don't have sunscreen and you're really sensitive, you're, you kill your sin, skin cells and you get sunburn, right? It's pretty tough on biology, but that's because biology uses long string polymers that get broken easily. But in the early, in the, say the progenian epoch, they would be very short polymers doing one job, or what are floating around, and so they're way less sensitive to UV. And it, Sutherland's group in the UK have shown that UV chemistry can actually create uh, ready-to-go nucleotides. There's a pathway, so now the entire field really is, is turned back to the warm little pond. And yes, uh, Dave Diemer pr wrote a paper about 20 years ago that said polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that could have been the first pigment. So you can imagine, I'll just do one, one thing that if you go through, if you took a biologist and a geologist through a time portal back 4.1 billion years, they would find a pool full of sludge. The geologist would say, I can't break that with a rock hammer, so it's not geology. The biologist would, would pipette that and look at it. It's like, it's just full of a bunch of random junk. It's not biology. It's not geology. It's not biology. And then they, they come back 100,000 years later, and all the sludge has gone black. It's like black, which is stromatolites have this black pigment, a lot of them, on the coast. And then so the geologist says, well, it's still not hard, so it's not a rock, and I don't care about it. It's just sludge. And, but the biologist pipettes that in the sequences, and he finds a little genetic sequence, a little DNA-like thing that winds and unwinds with hot water, and it makes some kind of a pigment, and that's why they're all black. Evolution's underway. Now they're capturing energy, and now they're free to go to any aqueous environment. So that, that's just a prediction. Thank you. Thanks. Over there. Hey. Um, yeah, kind of like following uh, Hammerov's lead a little bit, if any of you may have like a thought of um, where happiness and suffering come into the picture of the origin of life. You know, if you imagine, if you imagine the progenote, if you imagine a protocell, um, as I mentioned, and, and my wife Catherine talks about this too, the selective advantage for being able to sense its world 
evaluate good or bad for me and act on it reliably would have been enormous. Um, so I would like to imagine that those processes emerged. You can say that it emerged without or with some kind of conscious or sentient experience. I don't mind the notion of sentient experience at all at such an early stage, but in any case, the, the foundation for pain and suffering and joy are in that. Foods that way, poisons that way. But you need consciousness for that to happen. Yeah, in order to have experience, sure. Yeah, I, well, um, I'm not sure whether you need consciousness. If you don't do the right thing, you die. Correct. So, so, um, but why so, do you do the right thing or the wrong thing? Well, you both do the right thing. Some do the right thing. Some do the wrong things. The ones that do the wrong thing, they don't survive. Yeah, it's, just nat it's just natural selection. You know, to, to survive or to feel good? You know, Monod, Jacques Monod um, wrote his brilliant book, Chance and Necessity, and he invented the word teleonomic, meaning the appearance of doing without doing. And uh, he, he's brilliant. He was a brilliant man. When we want to talk about these things, I can always hear Monod muttering in my ear, how do you know it's just not an evolved molecular machine? And that's what Steen is saying as well. It could be that, and, and most people would say it simply was, in the absence of consciousness, natural selection will select out those systems able to evaluate, sense their worlds, evaluate their environment, and act reliably on it, but teleonomically in, in Monod's sense. Thanks to Jean Monod would say, grâce à sélection naturelle. Thank you. To, thanks to natural selection. So we may invoke the possibility that there's conscious experience, but I don't think we have to. I wish we did. So, so, so I don't know. Another way to think about it is that the way the world is made is somehow um, a reflection of I don't know consciousness, uh, and and then. Uh, then, then it, it all comes from there. Uh, so that has a sort of a spiritual um, undertone or overtone. And I can, um, I can live with that too. Uh, so, so then natural selection is a consequence of, uh, uh, of uh, how the matter is made and the matter is made of this ultimate cause that we can call consciousness or God, I don't know. Um, so, I think one of the things that is really, like if, if we all had the same feeling, we would have less possibilities of the things that we would generate. So if you think about life as this generative process, it's really important that people have different feelings and different perceptions of the world because they're gonna create different things. Um, and so, so one way I think about it is like, like we have theories for thermodynamics that count number of states and, and those are, are ensemble theories. So they talk about, um, you know, averages over many possible worlds, but if you ask about how the, the physical world could really instantiate as many possible states or possible futures as possible, it's really important for us to have different experiences because that's a better generative mechanism. So, so within the information framework, if you think information actually really is doing these kind of things, there, there may be some natural ways of thinking about why we have such diversity of human experience or feelings. Just for the record, I have a paper called How Life Evolved to Feel Good. If anybody wants to see it, email me and I'll send it to you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to throw this out. It seems to connect to what's just been said in that uh, it seems to me that a good portion of the direction of evolution from these very early little cells and protocells to us is governed by uh, you could say life learning how to manage instability because once you get a species that's evolved to fill a niche, that niche gives it a stability and that makes it difficult for that species to change. But if there's a possibility of self-monitoring and some kind of adaptive control, then you can exist in a state that otherwise would be unstable and gain flexibility to change in terms of environmental change. So I'd just like to throw that out as something for a comment. Um, one of the most fascinating things for us is that in the earliest phases, as we're now in the thought experiments territory of the progenote, 
world, which is rickety chemistry. It's like no species, right? It's just protocellular masses. It's a consortium model that, 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 micro, uh, that uh, micro, microbiologists talk about or, or microbial map people talk about. And it's all horizontal transfer. There's like almost, in the progenote world, there'd be no vertical descent. It's like this smush of shared stuff. It's all probabilistic. And if you actually go to Yellowstone, you see this. If you go to Yellowstone, the slight change in the flow of liquid out of a hot spring changes the, exquisitely changes the microbial community in its thickness and what's on top and what's on bottom and what's in the middle. And they, all, they assume all these shapes, just adapting just to local conditions, exquisitely local. So I think that life for billions of years was exquisitely localized, but on a continuous basis where there's no speciation going on. Just a little bit more photosynthesis here because you have access to it, but chemosynthesis here because you have access to it. And we have to actually rethink. If you're thinking about the origin of life and the first 90% of life on Earth, you have to think in a different term than you know, species competing. It, it's, a diff it's a different world. I, I, I'm sorry, we have to end this now. Uh, we're over time, and there's a film screening over in the Catalina Ballroom over in the hotel, and they have to set this room up for the banquet. So let's give our speakers, all four of them, a, a round of applause and thank the audience for hanging in there and asking such great questions, and thank you all.